Hello, hello there. My name's Gary Witter. I'm a screenwriter. You may know me from such movies as Rogue One, A Star Wars Story, The Book of Eli, and <coughs> After Earth. And now, somehow, I've also become a talk show host. I have my own little virtual talk show that exists right here inside the world of Animal Crossing New Horizons. And since you're all here, why don't we put on a show right now? We have some amazing guests for you. Let's get right to it. From the sun-kissed island of Kauai, it's Animal Talking. Today, join Gary and his guests, Colin Trevorrow, and from Guster, Ryan Miller. And now, because he's created a monster he can no longer control, here's your host, Gary Witta. <laughs> Wonderful. I love you all. Thank you so much for coming. It's such a treat to have you all here. Adam. Hello, hello. It's Friday. Is it? TGIF, my friend. TGIF. Oh. Thank goodness it's Friday. How are you, sir? How was your week? Uh, I barely know what day it is most I, of the I, time. I now, mean, so. none of us do in this quarantine, but especially with this show. I mean, I don't know which end is up these days. This show has blown up to such an extent. I feel like it's just completely uh, taken over my life. I don't know about you, but like, I, I haven't had a minute's rest the past week. This show's got, I, I made a joke about it in the intro, but this, yeah, we, this monster is out of control. It really is. I'm telling you, like, t- t- speaking of monsters out of control, we have uh, some very interesting guests on the show today who know quite a bit about that. Um, but before we get, we're going to get to them very quickly, but before we do that, um, it's a big news day in many ways. Usually Friday, they, you know, they call it take out the trash day. That's kind of when, you know, the non-interesting uh, news drops. But we actually have some really cool news that I, I'm very excited to share with you and with all of our uh, audience uh, here at Animal Talking. Um, first of all, our Twitch channel, our little channel over here at twitch.tv slash Gary Witter, just passed 1 million views. That's, I think that's a pretty big deal. Holy. I'm, as you can see, I'm absolutely just over, overjoyed. Overjoyed about it. Um, Congratulations. Very, yeah, very excited about that. That's really, really cool. Um, all right, that's enough. That's enough being overjoyed. Um, <laughs> we have our very own, as of yesterday, apparently, we have our very own subreddit. Reddit. I'm not on Reddit, but apparently, you know, I know it's a big deal. And someone has now created, I don't actually have the link. Maybe someone, maybe if someone's a bit more on the ball here, can post it into the chat. But Animal Talking now has its very own subreddit where you can go and discuss the show and talk about how much, you know, you don't like Adam. I, I thoroughly uh, support that. Uh, you should definitely be having those conversations. And there it is. It's actually very simple. Reddit.com slash R slash Animal Talking is where you go for all of your uh, uh, late breaking, uh, scintillating Animal Talking uh, discussion and a conversation on reddit and then a couple of very big things i mean that, that, that's all good with a million views and subreddit that's cool uh but there had there has been some very very big news that has that has developed just in the last i would say in the last 12 hours things have been popping off uh over here at uh uh, animal talking uh i think you know where i'm going with this adam i think you know i'm waiting i'm waiting i, all I right, think all i right. know so i was out uh running around yesterday uh, uh, doing a bit of shopping with my mask on uh, and getting uh, some stuff for my, uh, my, you know, my beautiful wife and executive producer here on the show who's working very hard on the show as we speak right now. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what she does on the show uh, later. Uh, but it's Mother's Day coming up on Sunday. Adam, hope you haven't, hope you haven't forgotten it's Mother's Day on Sunday. Uh, I have not forgotten. I've Good. been reminded many I'm, times. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear it. So have I. I'm glad to hear it. Um, so uh, I was out doing a little bit of Mother's Day shopping for my wife and uh my twitter started blowing up like way more than usual and i was like what's that all about um and it turned and it turns out um it turns out adam that um uh uh alexandria ocasio cortez who you know as, as i'm sure you know is quite a famous uh politician um yes. in uh, in the in our uh, united states congress one of our one of our government servants um uh, has recently started playing Animal Crossing, and what happens is now this is a, this is now a trend that has developed. Any time uh, a celebrity puts their their head above the uh, parapet and starts talking about 
um, how they're uh, how they're playing um, uh, Animal Crossing. Um, everyone immediately starts uh, tweeting them and and uh, saying, "Oh my God, you've got to go on Gary's show." Everyone's been tweeting at Brie Larson. Everyone's been tweeting at Chrissy Teigen, Danny Trejo. Uh, Elijah Wood, if you're famous and you play Animal Crossing, people are hassling you on Twitter to come on the show. And it has actually, I mean, I I, I don't encourage my uh, followers to do that. I, I personally don't go chasing around uh, people on Twitter. Some people I do. The people that I really, really want to get, uh, I do. Uh, but when uh, AOC, as she's uh, known, uh, started tweeting about how she's enjoying playing Animal Crossing, my Twitter started blowing up, uh, copying me into tweets to her saying, you've got to go on Gary's show. You've got to go on Gary's show. And... Um, Amazingly, a kind of a, a kind of an amazing thing happened, and this is why my my Twitter uh, was blowing up. AOC actually tweeted back at me, um, and here's the tweet right here. I uh, I tweeted at her, uh, "You should come be a guest on my talk show that takes place entirely inside the game." And I and I included a little link from when we had a a, a, a little bit of a story on uh, in Entertainment Weekly, and she responded, uh, and you can see the tweet right here. This is funny and bizarre enough to be very compelling to me, which actually that's that's how we get most of the guests on the show, by just how funny and bizarre uh, this whole thing is. And okay, so fair enough, they, 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 just, just to get a tweet from someone as as famous as AOC is obviously uh, you know, very flattering. Um, but I thought that's never gonna happen. Come on, this is never gonna come on the show. And then I wake up this morning, obviously they're three hours ahead over there in uh, Washington DC where they're doing uh, the people's work. And uh, the next thing I know, the next thing I know is this second tweet coming at me from AOC saying my communications director will be reaching out. And since then, her communications director has in fact reached out and we are in touch and we're going to figure out if there's a way to get AOC on the show, which I think would be pretty amazing. What do you think, Adam? I think that is an awesome, awesome opportunity. I, I, mean, I would be so excited to hear what you guys, uh, the values you share in Animal Crossing. I just want to talk to look when my, my favorite thing to do when guests who play Animal Crossing, not everyone who comes on the show plays Animal Crossing um, and they don't need to even because we have we have a little bit of Hollywood magic over here that we that we do to, to get, enable our guests to come on the show. Uh, but when you do play Animal Crossing, as AOC does, we like them to bring our own char their own character over to the island and we like to uh, talk to them about Animal Crossing. So my preference would be to talk to a a AOC about Animal Crossing. What's her island like? You know, how does she like to play the game? Why does the game appeal to her? Does she play other video games? Is she a gamer? Let's find out. I would love to talk to her about all those things. I think that would be wonderful. Wonderful. So everybody stay calm. I'm trying to stay calm. All of us over here at Animal Talk are trying to stay calm because AOC obviously is a very big deal. She's a very big celebrity. Um, uh, very important person. Uh, it could be our first genuine VIP. You know, that's that, you know, I don't know if you're aware of it, but that's what VIP stands for. Very important person. All right. So let's, okay. I got one. I want to get straight. I want to get to our first guest as quickly as possible uh, because it's a, he's a really, really great guest. And I'm, we're so lucky to have him. We've, I can't believe he's actually here, but it's a big thrill to have him on the show. Big, big get. Um, but I do want to drop just one other little thing. I couldn't, I really couldn't uh, affect the timing of this because it's all, you know, the powers that be decide when these things drop. Um, at 9 a.m. Uh, this morning, uh, DC Comics uh, revealed something. It was the kind of the official announcement, like the embargo lifted at 9 a.m. Uh, today and of course I'm doing the show right now, so I I, I can't like be, be be engaging with it right now. Um, but we did pre-record a little video last night that that, that dropped uh, at nine o'clock, uh, right? Uh, you know, about 25 minutes ago. I'm going to post the link in the chat right now. Put this in your back pocket. Don't go look at it right now because I want you to be watching the show. Uh, but I'll give I'll give you the lowdown right now. I'll give you the skinny. This is something I've been wanting to talk about for a long time because it's really exciting. Uh, myself and my good friend Greg Miller uh, got to do something. Uh, that I certainly have always wanted to do, and I know Greg always uh, wanted to do, we got to write a Batman comic, a real one, for DC Comics. Like a real one that will be in the comic book stores. Um, that is so awesome. And so, talking about things that you learn all the time, uh, it's the 20, 2020 is actually the 80th anniversary of the Joker. He's 80 years old, the most famous comic book villain of all time, one of the most iconic comic book characters of all time. And to celebrate Looks that... Great. I'm telling you, so he, I mean, he looks great, right? 80 years old. He's, I mean, I think it's all the makeup. It's got to help, right? <laughs> it's got to help. Um, so to celebrate the 80th anniversary of the Joker, uh, DC Comics is putting out this amazing book. It's called The Joker 80th Anniversary 100-Page Super Spectacular. And what it does is it collects together some of the most talented names in comics, and apparently also me and Greg for some reason. Uh, they were, DC invited us all 
to come and tell. It's an anthology of short stories, um, different takes on the Joker. Um, and, um, and DC invited us to write a, a completely new, original uh, Joker, Batman, DC Universe story. And we did it. It's called Kill the Batman. And it's going to be out on uh, June 9th. And uh, I highly recommend, if you want to, it's going to be very limited. Uh, there's going to be variant covers. DC is really, really pushing the boat out on all of this. Uh, we're very excited about it. Get the to a comic book store. Call them up right now. Get this on your pull list. Go order it digitally. Obviously, a lot of comic book stores are closed right now because of COVID. Um, but, you know, some of them are doing curbside pickup. DC Comics even has like a comic store locator that you can go to and it'll tell you where there's a local comic store that's still open or still doing curbside pickup in your area. And of course, you can go um, and, and get it digitally as well. There's all kinds. Of, you can do it mail order, all kinds of ways to get your hands on the Joker 80th anniversary 100 page Super Spectacular. And the story that Greg and I did brilliantly brilliantly illustrated by a very very talented artist by the name of dan mora um is really really cool and we somehow found a way and i'm not going to name any names well i could say mr freeze because we revealed that yesterday um we got all of our famous all, all of our favorite dc characters uh into um uh, uh into the story i'm not gonna I'm, I'm not gonna confirm it right here i'll just simply say one of my my favorite my personal favorite dc character is superman and I'll just leave it at that. I'll let you join the dots, Adam. You can connect. How did this dots. not? How did this not kill Greg? I, I mean, when I so what happened was uh, DC asked me if I wanted to do it, and I said, you know what? I've been wanting to work on something with Greg for a long time. He loves loves DC. His galaxy brain DC knowledge can only come in handy here. I went to him and said, DC DC's offered me this opportunity. I would love to share this opportunity with you. And you know, d being the DC fanboy that he is he just completely lost it and i thought and i thought that was really really cool and so we did it together and um very excited very very excited about the um uh, uh joker 80th anniversary 100 page super spectacular june 9th uh a, a month a one month and one day from now uh that's going to be in the comic book stores and on your digital device whatever it is that you read comics really 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 cool uh, one more thing before we bring our guest on. He's patiently waiting in our green room where there are no snacks. Uh, unless he sets set some snacks out for himself, there's nothing for him to eat right now because we don't have snacks in our digital green room. Uh, but he's going to be joining us in just a moment. Uh, but one last very, very quick piece of business. Um, since I was talking about Greg Miller, uh, we have some wonderful, wonderful guests coming up on the show on Monday. Greg Miller is going to be here live on the show on Animal Talking uh, Monday morning, 9 a.m., uh, Pacific time and we're going to talk about his career we're going to talk about video games IGN kind of funny and of course we're going to talk about this new we're going to get to get, a, get into a little bit more detail about the Batman comic the Joker comic that we collaborated on but New York Times best-selling author uh, Chuck Wendig uh, uh, another member of the Star Wars family of course he wrote the uh, aftermath trilogy of novels that told the official canonical story of what happened immediately after Return of the Jedi Chuck's going to be here on the show and comedian Samantha Ruddy who's very very funny she's a tremendously talented stand-up comedian and comedy writer is going to be here on the show she's been on Stephen. she's literally I, I she showed me the clip she's been on Stephen colbert she's been on the late show and now she's doing this show i don't know if that means she's going down or we're coming up or we're meeting somewhere in the middle i don't know but she's going to be on the show uh and i can't wait to have all of those guests uh on the show on monday i think we're going to try to do their sound check and set to her uh sometime this um this weekend so that's Monday's show, but let's focus on the here and now, uh, 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 Adam. I'm going to go get behind my desk here. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, moving out of the way for a moment, please. Oh, because you know okay. it's very. You know, there's not a lot of room on this set. It's, it's my basement. There's not a lot of room. We do this on a very low budget. Um, I'd like. I'd like now. Um, to bring on my first guest. And if he's listening to the Discord, he knows that now is the time to unmute his microphone because his character is about to come down the stairs here uh, on our set in the beautiful um, sunkissed island of Kauai. Please welcome um, a really, really cool uh, guest. I'm so glad to have him. We're in the same business. He's much more successful and talented than I am, but we are technically in the same business. So I'm very <laughs> excited to talk to him. He's a multi-talent. He's a writer. He's a director. Uh, directed uh, several excellent films, but most most known, of course, most known, of course, as uh, the co-writer and the director of Jurassic World, which made more than one point five billion dollars. Billion with a B, Adam. Billion. Wow. Worldwide, one of the biggest box office hits uh, in recent memory, and he's currently directing the third movie in this series, Jurassic World Dominion. Except he's not. He's not Adam. He's sitting around at home in the UK where he was shooting the movie, twiddling his thumbs, 
because you know the, all the big movie productions have been closed down temporarily by COVID-19. That's how we were getting able to get him on the show. I said, what are you doing, Colin? He said, nothing. I was supposed to be directing a movie, but right now I'm just sitting around. I said, come on the show. And so he's coming on the show. In fact, he's coming on right this minute. Please welcome, coming down the stairs right now to the show, my friend, Colin Trevorrow. <laughs> Here he comes. Look at that. I actually remembered to put Colin's um, uh, Chiron up right away. I didn't get it. I didn't miss it this time. Uh, I'm very pleased about that. Um, Colin Trevorrow, th uh, Colin Trevorrow, thank you so much for joining us here on Animal Talking. What a, what a treat it is to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for creating my avatar. I, Do you uh, like? Are you pleased I, with the look of your avatar? Because we had we made it for you. Because yeah. go ahead. Let, let's talk about. I, I wanted process. to dress up. I, I'd never been on a talk show, and I, you know, I, this has been a dream of mine since I was uh, a young child. So I'm ready to like scoot down the couch later and, and make you know pithy comments with the second guest. Everything. I'm I really love. It. I, I, we do it. We do it just the way. Just the way the big boys do. In fact, we are. We are one yeah. of the big boys now. Um, <laughs> so. Um, let me ask you just real quick because I want to talk about the tuxedo and the whole look and everything. But first of all, like, did have you been on? Have you been on a quote unquote real late night talk show before? Like when you were doing Jurassic World press, did you do any uh, of that late night talk show circuit or anything? No, and I and I I've wanted to do it so bad that I've I've made requests to go on on smaller like morning shows. I did a cooking segment on a show and did uh, you really? What did yeah, you cook? It wouldn't, we were in Ohio. It was some kind of chopped salad, and I was I was really committed to it. I did it without like an ounce of irony. I, I really it was just on my bucket list of things I want to do is, is do, do a, a cooking, cooking segment. segment on a on a morning show, and and I did it. We were in Cleveland, Ohio. We got to find a way to get a cooking segment on this show, Adam. I don't know how we would do that exactly, but we got to find a way. <laughs> maybe maybe we can do a, a crossover with like Cooking Mama or Cook Serve Delicious or something like that. Uh, Colin, seriously, I I, I know that I'm, I I just want to say thank you. Thank you for bringing a much needed touch of class to this show by wearing a tuxedo. I know you specifically requested that. We were happy to get it for you. We have a big wardrobe department here at the show. We've had, I, let me tell you, we've had people, I don't know if you've seen the show before, but we've had people wear all sorts on this show. They treat this show like it's the Met Gala. I don't know what people, what some people are thinking when they dress up to come on this show, but you've gone for a timeless classic look and I appreciate that. My only opportunity to dress up in the past two months, I'm taking Right. That. Are you just doing the kind of the sweatpants around the house thing? Like, what's your what's your what's your coronavirus, uh, you know, work from home uh, uh, wardrobe like? I, I have two pairs of pants, and uh, one of them uh, was was torn horribly. We we got an Aerobee, uh, which if you grew up in California in the '90s was like a major step forward in frisbee technology uh, that hit during that time. And I introduced it to my <laughs> my kids. Uh, we've been hitting it pretty hard outside, and I ripped them yesterday. My, so now I have one pair of pants left. I love it. I love it. Well, and again, I want to. I do want to thank you uh, for coming on the show, and congratulations, by the way, for getting on the show before AOC does it, and the show becomes so big that it's no longer cool. Right before you have a real VIP on. You got in. You got because everyone sure. now. That's, uh, you, uh, by the way, Colin, <laughs> just between you and me, I'm sure you've experienced. Like, after you, after you became a big, big deal after Jurassic World, I'm sure you experienced this. You'd be amazed, especially just in the last 24 hours after AOC uh, popped up. The number of people I've got coming out of the woodwork. Oh, they're all coming out sure. of the woodwork, Colin. It's it's it's, it's depressingly predictable. Um, but you know that's 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 my problem to deal with. Now, listen, Colin, I've got a lot I want to I want to talk to you about your career. I want to talk about you know, talk to you about Jurassic World and all kinds of stuff. But first of all, we must address uh, the elephant in the room. There's a big elephant in the room, and I feel like you know a, a lot of people in the chat are, are, you know are going to want to talk about it. Uh, so uh, let's let, I mean let's just, just let's just get that out of the way. Um, Let's see. Here is the elephant in the room. Uh, we just added it to the set. It's really cool, um, and uh, I, I don't know. If, I don't know if it's going to have much much functionality on the set, uh, but I do, but I do I do like it. Um, and uh, what I don't know is this, is this interactive, Adam? Can you actually slide down this thing? Uh, you can't. You can you cannot. Okay, I, I think I'm just going to take it out of the set. If it's just if it's purely decorative, I don't think it's going to work. So we'll, uh, we'll maybe we'll maybe. What does Colin think? Colin, what do you they think? They don't have real elephant elephants on this show. I thought it was I thought it was a real elephant when you when you mentioned this. Oh, I mean, good. I wouldn't be surprised if there was an actual animal because you know elephant. in Animal Crossing, Colin, you you are the only human. Everyone, uh, well, the non-player characters are animals. So I mean, this could be like a yeah. weird animal character, an elephant character. I don't. Know. I assume too much. I I, I, don't, I don't think we're going to keep it around on the show, uh, Adam. It, it's just getting in the way. It was so we, we we try new things all the time. Not everything works. 
Um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll move it out of the show, uh, out of the set after this show. Um, Colin, let's 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 let's, yeah. let's talk about let's talk about you. Let's talk about your career. I, I always like to go back to the beginning. Let me let, let me ask you this: How did you get into film? When, when did your love of film begin? Were you a were you a film nerd as a child? I was. Yeah, I was. I was uh, making films when I was you know 11, 12. This is back. The first one was a VHS, and then we went into Hi8. That was our technology. And uh, I had a moment like a couple weeks ago where I, I was uh, at the very same, my son who's the very same age that I was when I made my first movie with my friends, he's 11. And uh, when we did it, there was, a, there was a, a sequence where a character was out in the middle of the street and got hit by a car. And uh, my friend's dad, you know, this is the late 80s, my friend's dad drove uh, there, I think it was an Isuzu Trooper 2, uh, down the street and hit, you know, hit this car and, and uh, you know, hit the car into, into this uh, body. And it was this, you know, everyone in the neighborhood thought it was a thing. And, uh, and I was the other day with my son and I was driving for him because he was making a movie with my daughter. Uh, they're making this like really high, high, high tension action thriller. Uh, and I was driving for them. And it, it was, I would say, probably 30 something years later, I was doing exactly what my friend's dad did. Right. Uh, for me. It was a moment. Now, I know, you know, I, 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 I loved I loved films uh, when I was a kid. I, 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 did, I, um, I devoured everything. I had a massive collection originally of, you know, VHS tape. Were you, were you, were you, you're you roughly the same age as me. You grew up in the VHS era? Sure. It's. I grew it, up where it, you where you are now. I, I know. I so I, now, you're, you're I was, stuck I'm over there the in, the, in the in the UK right now. Yeah, we kind yeah. of swapped places, right? You're from the Bay Area, okay. which is where I now live, mm -hmm. and uh, I used to live in in the UK, which is where you now are. So we've kind of traded sure. off here. Um, I live here. I'm, I'm permanent. You, are you? You're not coming back. You, you you're done. No, with America? no. I, I moved four years ago. We we uh, we. Our house is here. Oh, this is it. I, I thought you were just out there because that's where Jurassic World was shooting. No, no, we made a we made a life choice, man. What and, and what was the basis of that choice? Why did you make that choice? Uh, uh, a bunch of things. Uh, it, you know, a little bit of a just thinking about how I wanted my kids to grow up and, and what kind of you know what kind of a you know, just world of diversity and experience I wanted them to be able to access and and my, my wife is French and so her whole family's in France and uh, up until recently you know we've really been able to expose them to to a lot and it's just a, it's an amazing place to grow up in London is an incredible city and uh, that was pretty much it uh, you know obviously a little bit of problems with uh, the current management uh, in America but I'm not gonna <laughs> make it a political thing it's not a political thing I just uh, I thought it would be a great place to be uh, and it's, it's obviously one of my favorite places in the world. It's where I'm from. It'll always have a special place in my heart for it. And I talked about maybe coming back there and retiring there one day, like a nice little, a nice little village, a nice little cottage in a village, something, a sleepy little village. Where I think would be. Would be yeah, we we live in a sleepy little village. Do you really? And, and, and do you like? Yeah. The, you like? No, you don't I don't live, live in, in the big city. city. You like the small town life, the village life. Yeah. Well, we're out on a we're out on a farm, and we've got a little village next to us, and you know, there's we've got chickens, we get fresh eggs every day, and uh, it's it's nice out here. I love it. Quiet. I love it. Let's let's get back to you and your career. So like, yeah, so we both love to watch movies as, as a kid. There's, I mean, there's a lot of cineasts out there. We all love movies, but they don't all feel the need to pick up a camera. At what point did your love of film turn into the desire to actually start making films? Were you, were you running around with like a little VHS camcorder or something as a kid and making your own little home movies the way Spielberg was when he was a kid? I was doing that. I was also really into theater, and so I was, you know, I was performing and I was into music, so I was singing a lot. And there was a lot of different uh, my. A lot of different uh, elements that go into filmmaking uh, were interests that I had. My dad was uh, my dad was actually a country rock uh, musician. He had a he had a band in the '80s that called Hearts on Fire that that ended up uh, you know, they would play like pretty big stadiums. They would open for like Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, and right. And so I would see my dad on stage, you know, in, you know at the Cow Palace where you've probably been to, mm -hmm. uh, just uh, you know with their cowboy hats and like they they had this they had this vibe that we don't really have anymore. That early that early '80s uh, Bay Area country rock vibe. Right, uh, and and he was just a legend uh, to me. Uh, still is. He's he is alive, uh, and just growing up in such you know the Bay Area is is a, a really just it's it's a vibrant place that is full of all kinds of performing arts and all different kinds of people. And I, I was just so lucky to grow up there. I want to talk to you about um, how that turned into like a real career for you. You you first kind of burst onto the scene as many uh, filmmakers do with like this amazing little indie movie that came out of nowhere called safety, not guaranteed. And it's a fascinating story because it's a movie that actually grew out of a, It was an internet meme. 
And then, so it explains mm-hmm. me how this. So I guess somebody wrote a spec script based on that internet meme, and then it became a movie. Like, like tell me how it all happened. Well, Derek wrote it. You know, my writing partner. Uh, right. It, 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 the way it started is we were at, uh, we were at our, our agent, and our agent at that time said, "Look, guys, look. The only way you're going to make any money in this town right now is go down the aisles of of a toy." store uh go to walmart and find a product and make a movie uh about write a spec script about that product and we both said okay well we're gonna kill ourselves so we went to the top of the parking garage uh, we're looking out over la and having this moment where we're like is this it man or like are we gonna quit uh and this, this is ridiculous and derek said well you know what there's this meme uh where that says you know wanted someone to travel back in time with me uh, you've only done this once before. You must bring your own weapon. Safety not guaranteed. And to anyone who knows the meme, that's a brand. So why right. don't we make that? What, what's uh, what's great about I, it is that what appealed to me even just when I first saw that meme as a, as a storyteller is like, just from that tiny little bit of text, you can kind of infer like a whole amazing backstory, right? And that's what the point of writing the, of making the movie was. Yeah, I, I thought it was, it was a brilliant idea uh, on on Derek's part, uh, and I, and I loved the script and. Uh, and it was just one of those things. I'd, I'd been just a writer, you know, I, I didn't really, I think there's there's a bit of a myth that I just appeared out of nowhere, but uh, like you, like I, I was writing, uh, wrote for every major studio for a long period of time. I sold my first script to Steven actually in, in 2006, uh, which is about video games. Uh, I sold it to DreamWorks, it was called Tester. Oh, cool. Uh, and it was, it was about a Marine who came back uh, from Iraq and was struggling with PTSD uh, and goes into a clinical trial uh, that claims they're going to help him. And it turns out in this clinical trial, they're they're wiring uh, humans uh, with neuro wires to be able to control them like avatars. Uh, oh, wow. And, and he goes on the run and his other guys are sent after him being controlled from like this sort of central space. And so I sold that to DreamWorks. Uh, and then, you know, I, you and I have, have had definitely periods of time where we were probably doing similar things and so going on, you know, taking the job that we could get and doing right. the best we could possibly do and facing tons of rejection along the way and and at moments thinking, well, maybe I got to get out of here and find something else to do. And right. then they always give you just enough to keep you going because Hollywood's pretty good at that. Just yeah. enough to make you not quit. Right. Uh, and, kind uh, of and that was a subsistence while. diet. Yeah, yeah. And so that was, you know, that was when I was 30. I think I made safety when I was 36 or 37. And so when I finally made that film, I went back in to do the tour of, of offices that you go through once you've made a Sundance film that people like. Everyone knew me. Uh, you know, I'd been in those rooms before. I, I kind of had a sense of how the whole studio system works. So it made it a lot easier for me to navigate that that crucial moment that so many filmmakers can get. It's just a little uh, disorienting that suddenly you were just making a movie with a bunch of your friends. Right. And now suddenly you're in these rooms and everyone's saying, well, what do you got? next what's your next thing how can we monetize that please trust me trust me and, Colin uh, after the last two weeks I know the feeling <laughs> yeah there you go I know there the you feeling. go I mean, I but if, if you're so fortunate like it's, it's an amazing moment and so like any any time I think in this business you you get like one moment to strike and so be as prepared as possible and I was I was definitely as prepared as I could be so let's talk about that moment. The movie that really brought you to the attention of the world was, of course, uh, Jurassic World, which I thought quite brilliantly uh, to totally reinvigorated a franchise that a lot of people, I think, prior to that thought was maybe kind of running out a little bit of steam, running out of ideas. And you found a way to make it completely fresh and completely reinvented it. Um, I th- I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like you had a, a lot of this happens to a lot of filmmakers. It happened to my friend Gareth Edwards. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. he made a, he made a little indie movie like, you know, you made safety guar- not guaranteed. He made monsters. It caught the attention of the film world, and suddenly they right. want to they want to grab you. This indie this indie filmmaker with a with a with a with a voice, clearly with talent, and now they want to give you like two hundred million dollars and have you direct like a mega mega movie. Just, just it, it, right. it, I'm sure you remember it well. Like what what was the moment where like when did you get that call? How did you know that you were getting called up to the big leagues and Spielberg and Frank Marshall and all these guys want you to du- direct one of the one of the biggest franchise movies of all time? Uh, I got a call from Frank. Uh, and I was in my house in Vermont. I lived in, I didn't live in LA. I lived in Vermont um, for uh, about eight years uh, before he moved here. So I haven't lived in LA since, you know, God, 2006, seven. Um, and I got a call from Frank and he, and I knew it was coming. And he, he said, look, you know, we're, we're going to, it was Jurassic Park four at the time. Uh, and he, he gave me a, you know, a little bit of the plot that they were messing around with. And, and I, re- I remember, I was like, yeah, but Frank, like, why is Jurassic? Park for like why are, are we doing this? <laughs> and, I mean, other, and other than real... other than it's a license to print money, but there has to be a creative imperative to make a movie, right? Not just a, an economic imperative. At least for yeah, for me, uh, and and yet also it, it ended up 
uh, it ended up providing me with what I could make a movie about uh, in that, you know, the very film itself was you know, this, whether this is a good idea or not, this is going to, the doors of this park are going to open, even if uh, people might die. Right. Uh, and, and, and it really felt like, oh, okay, well, we can, we can do something that is, that's about how, you know, if uh, no matter what, uh, if there's money to be made, uh, then even a bad idea becomes a good idea. Right. Yeah. And how, how, how true and how prophetic that turned out to be. What do you think it was? I mean, maybe, maybe they told you. What, what was it that Spielberg and Frank Marshall saw in you from Safety Not Guaranteed and your previous work that made them think you were ready to direct a movie of this scale? The only thing he ever said to me was, you know, and he also, you know, they'd read my other scripts. They, they do their due diligence. And look, everyone, everyone talks to each other. There are probably, you know, 10 people out there who I'd come in contact with or worked with who, who had to testify on my behalf in order for me to get in the room in the first place. Uh, but he said, you know, I, when he watched, say I was in Australia, I was on the tour uh, of, of small film festivals, which was like my favorite thing I ever got to do, uh, is go to different film festivals uh, with that movie. And I was in Sydney, Australia, and I heard, uh, I got a call that Stephen had watched the movie and then he watched it again at his, I guess he'd had a family reunion or something over the weekend, he showed it to everybody. And finally down the road, he said to me, you know, at the end of that movie, you had a choice to make. And the choice was, you know, does the time machine not work? Uh, and therefore the message is, uh, you know, there is no hope. Uh, or does the time machine work and, and the message of the movie is magic is possible? And he said, based on the choice that I made, uh, that was the difference uh, between being in the room I was in or not being. I mean, I can, I can guess which, which of those choices Spielberg would prefer. Well, I think we know. Yes, indeed. Um, but I mean, like, I mean, even devoid of any context, if Steven Spielberg said to me, which which ending do you think I like better? The one where magic is possible or is there is no hope? I, I think I can make an educated guess just in general. Sure. But you know that that wasn't the original ending. Like the movie, the movie that we got into Sundance with had uh, had the opposite ending of that. And I changed it at the last minute. Oh, how um, interesting. Before we went to Sundance, we'd already, we had to call them and say, look, we changed the ending. So it's, you know, this time the time machine works. Uh, and they were like, yeah, okay, I guess that's fine. You can stay in, in competition with this. But I, I was in New York City and I just had this moment where I felt like, you know, I had been very, as with every script, like if, especially if someone else wrote it, I, I really commit to the, to the voice and the vision of the writer. And I was so committed to Derek's voice and vision with that movie. And then I just had this deep feeling that my machine works or doesn't work. Uh, right. you know, that will define whether it's my, it's something I was even involved in. Like, what, what do I need for this to be something that's also for me? Do you think uh, that- And that, you, was, that was my contribution. Do you think your, dis, that your decision, because it's a big deal, like the way that the way that a movie ends, I often say that 90% of the way you feel about a movie gets decided in the last 10 minutes of the film. Like the ending's really important. And right. um, that, that, and that's, that's a big deal. Like it's a t the movie leaves you with a totally different taste in your mouth based on whether the time machine works or doesn't work. Do you, do, do, does the fact, I don't want to get like too, too deep and inside the actor studio with you here, but like the fact that you that made that choice, do you think that's set, that says something about your philosophy in life or like your sensibility as a filmmaker that you wanted the movie to have a hopeful ending rather than a, a hopeless one? Yeah, I think it was a, it was a declaration. Uh, and I think, you know, each of, each of the movies I've done have, have been very clearly about something that I'm, that, not that I'm just thinking about at the time, that, that it's just a piece of me. And every, you know, you don't have that luxury when you're writing scripts for other people, as I've also done, and like you do, uh, that, you know, you can put that much of yourself into it all the time. And sometimes you right. get very lucky and you can, right? But when you're when it, making a film like that, it was a $750,000 movie. You know, I, I really got to, uh, to just put a part of myself into it. And I've, I've been lucky enough to be able to do that ever since, you know, for better or for worse. And, and here we are. And, and, and how fortuitous for you that you did change the ending because Spielberg, to, like, you could have made the exact same movie but with a different ending. And in, but in that reality, you don't get the call from Steven Spielberg. Is that right? I have thought about that alternate 1985 many a time, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> but you did, you did get the call. And I asked you what Frank Marshall and Steven Spielberg and you know, Universal Studios, uh, Universal Pictures, sorry, saw in you. Um, and they had faith in you. Did you have faith in yourself when you suddenly get called up to make a massive, massive movie, the likes of the scale of which, like, you know, the, 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 the stock price of the parent company is going to move right. based on how this movie does. Did that freak you out? Did you have any doubts or did you feel like you were ready? Uh, no, well, I wasn't. Uh, 
I didn't really think about any of it until recently. Like I've just finally reached the point where I can like look back at my life with some kind of context. And in that moment, like it was all going so fast that it was the, you know, if you're if you're jumping out of the airplane to like fight the alien invasion, you're not asking why they're here. Right. You're just you're just gonna go fight. And and that was I had this opportunity and and I was pretty much just going to uh, I was going to play the part of of someone who had made five movies. Uh, and just completely uh, em- embrace my instincts and just trust uh, in-, in how I felt about any given moment and also trust the people around me uh, because that's that's how any movie is made, no matter how movie how many movies uh, you have directed, you have to trust your collaborators. And so I, I just, I went all in and uh, yeah, there, there was a couple of moments of just like, you know, sitting in the trailer, staring at myself in the mirror, being like, are you fucking serious, bro? You're gonna walk out there and pretend you're, okay, okay. There are those moments. They exist are you, forever. Like. Are you good at silencing your inner critic, the, the the imposter syndrome, or do you struggle with that? Uh, I I struggle with. It. Yeah. I mean, who I mean, doesn't? Can you? Yeah, I, I can mean, you? I, I would I, mean, I would honestly be worried about you if you told me you didn't. No, God no. I, uh, I, I the, the thing I struggle with the most is is uh, intention versus perception. You know, my intention uh, and what I'm looking to communicate at any given moment or in a movie itself versus the perception of the audience. And it's become very, it's become more and more complicated. I think in, uh, in, you know, in the past, in recent years, as people have been able to just share their opinions on social media and, and, and you know, create, uh, you know, a, a shared opinion about certain things. And so as I move forward, I'm, I'm constantly thinking about, all right, what could be the perception of any number of people of any given uh, point of view based on what I'm, the moment I have, the shot I'm in, the scene it, that I'm in, how would I look at this uh, if I was anyone but me? Uh, it's an important thing to think about. It's very, very wise. Um, so, okay, so you, you direct the movie, Jurassic World now premieres and opens in like thousands and thousands of theaters all over the world. Were you nervous at that point or, do you, or were you able to look at the film and say like, yeah, we got this. I, I know this movie's good. People are going to like it. Or were you worried right up until the last minute how people might respond to the film? I felt we didn't test it. And so, but I, I felt good about the movie because I, I felt like, you know, I was watching it as a 12 year old. When I watched it, I, it was essentially directed by a 12 year old because that's, that was the mind space. You can kind of tell, I actually saw it recently. I hadn't seen it in a long time. It's like, this movie's directed by a child. <laughs> What's going on? It's just like how many dinosaurs, how many people can this thing eat? And yet, there's there was a joy in that. There was it really. There's this there's this thing in that movie of like a kid sort of smashing his dinosaurs together in his playroom, uh, but like right. really large that you can really feel uh, in a visceral way. And I didn't, you know, our our life was so strange because my family, you know, we I, we had two kids and still do, and we moved. Uh, from Vermont, we were staying in this tiny little cottage, and at the moment that that, that movie was the largest, the biggest opening weekend of all time, and right. we were we had this three room cottage, and we had moved all the furniture out. And my daughter was like eating her lunch on a cardboard box, and I remember just looking at my wife like, "Well, this is." I'm sure people think we're like on a boat right now, but this is this is the opening weekend of, of Jurassic World. <laughs> we're sitting on these cardboard boxes. Um. And so the so the movie comes out, and and, and you know it's I, I think what you said about the tw- I think about this all the time the twelve year old uh, inside of us that mm-hmm. inner child I think that's kind of what keeps us alive as creatives and it's what makes I think it's what made Rogue helped at least because obviously just one tiny cog in a wheel but it's what helped make Rogue One successful I think it's certainly what made Jurassic World successful is if you don't if you don't have that inner child and I often said that you know, you, you kind of uh, made the same uh, analogy that I often said that you know when I was a kid uh, playing with Star Wars figures. And 30 years yeah. later, I'm still playing with Star Wars figures, except these ones cost $200 million. And yep. um, if you don't have that attitude, if you don't bring that kind of childlike joy and wonder to it, how do you? How can you possibly expect to communicate that to an audience? I still have it. I have it every day. And I, and I had it on that movie. I actually, uh, this is pretty cool, man. Uh, I didn't see, uh, I was there when Gareth shot Darth Vader. Oh my God, you hallway. lucky bastard. I, I was, Standing like ten feet away from it. Oh my and, god! It uh, ended up being one of the most. Was, wait, which scene? The hallway scene or the Krennic scene? The hall. The hallway just he oh just goes ham on goodness. everybody in the hallway. Wow! I think didn't and you I, tell me that Peter Jackson was there as well for that? I don't remember. 
He may have been. I mean, I, you know, they were there for a couple of days, but right, I, uh, right, right. Jay Bayona and I were in the next building. We were working on Jurassic, and and Gareth calls. He's like, "You guys got to get down here right now. Come check this out." I'm like, All right. <laughs> and we we run down there. He's like, I, I, he, st- "He stood us in this place. Like, I want you to look down that corridor. Just look into the darkness right now, uh, and you're going to see something really cool. We had oh no God, idea. I'm so and so it's, of you it right was now. that same like the lightsaber firing up, and we were just looking at it for real. It was unbelievable. I had my own version of that, but it wasn't quite as cool as what you experienced. I I saw Gareth after the movie wrapped he was still working in post and I went to um, uh, Lucasfilm where he, uh, ILM where he was working on it and he, show, he said you got to see this and he showed me the scene uh, but it was very early you know you know what these early assemblies look like all the there's no wire removal yet no music no visual effects no lightsaber it was he was just holding a stick but even at that moment I, I'm watching this and going this scene is going to absolutely kill when people see it and I, yeah, did you get the same it. feeling when you were watching him shoot it oh yeah I, I feel like there's got to be a take where you like hear me like, what is life? Like <laughs> in the background, I, I, I could not, uh, I couldn't, could, uh, Jay, Jay was like jumping up and down. It was pretty cool. I love these it. These are the I memories, man. I, I, these things like, you know, there's a lot of ups and downs in this, in this business, but these are just indelible moments that I will carry with me forever. I, I had so many, so many moments of my own on the on the Rogue One set. You know, standing in I went, when I walked onto the into the Rebel control room in Yavin, which they had, which they they pulled the original blueprints uh, from yeah. the original movie and rebuilt that set mm-hmm. to absolute pinpoint accuracy. And I've watched that movie so many times. When I walked onto that set, Colin, seriously, I almost cried because it was like walking yeah. back in time to 1977, yeah. and it was just like unlike anything I've ever ever experienced. Um, right. Oh, yeah, the I, thing, I, I did have this sense because I had to kind of keep it cool because, you know, I and so I mean, <laughs> yes, I, I, I like what you've done here. Of course. Yes. Good. Uh, but <laughs> when I saw all those sets, but it, yeah, of course, I was like, oh, my God. How can you not? How can you not? Just so you know, that's exactly how I feel right now listening to you two talk about this shit. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is, I mean, this is, this is a dream, dream come true, Adam, to be a part of this amazing uh, enterprise that we've, that we've seen somehow things. scrabbled I've together here. Things. Yeah, I, I, I had so many moments like that, like when R2-D2 rolled by me on, on set for the first time. And it's just there's these little moments, like you said, like, how is this my life? Like, you, you just feel so blessed yeah. that your life has brought Mine, you. My, my other one was when I was, uh, Mark was here. Mark Hamill came to our home uh, on our farm. And I was looking, he was in uh, my son's room with my daughter, and I was looking in there and my son and daughter are holding out their Luke Skywalker figures. And these are mine from the 80s that I'd kept and I gave to them. And my son's like, so this is you. And I was like, get out of town. What the, what, what is this? <laughs> this is happening. He's like sitting re- on the floor. I really, I, so I said that I haven't tweeted a lot of people trying to get them on the show, but I know Mark a tiny little bit. Um, you know, once we're kind of friends on Twitter, we follow each other. I was actually supposed to have lunch with him in LA uh, a couple of years ago, and I had a personal situation. I had, to, I had to cancel on Mark Hamill, which, you know, I guess that's bragging oh, rights man. of its own, but I much rather would have had lunch <laughs> with him. But oh. I am now hoping, I, again, I, I tweeted at him one time and he hasn't responded. And I, I'm please don't hammer him on Twitter, don't do this. But if I had a wish list, I do have a wish list for people that I want to get on the show, and Mark Hamill is on it. He's, and, and, and yeah. for, no, for no other reason uh, than he's a fantastic talk show guest. I don't know if you've ever seen him on like yeah. The Tonight Show, but he's hilarious. Really, really great talk show guest. Uh, guest. A very uh, so special okay, human let, being, amazing let's, and, and now, of course, you're directing Jurassic World uh, Dominion, the third uh, yeah. uh, film in the series. I don't like to say franchise because it kind of feels like a corporate term, but the third, third film in the, in the series. Um, what can you tell us about it? Uh, you know, I mean, you know, not much as always. Um, I, I think this is, I feel so much more comfortable talking as an avatar than I do as a human. And I've realized that. Well, that's how we're going to get the straight dope out of you. You don't realize uh, that you're actually on a talk show. What can I tell you? I mean, I, I obviously can't say much beyond that. We're having an incredible time making it. And, you know, I, I love our crew and our cast. And especially now that I've both on both sides, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of these people on several movies in a row. So it's a real family. And uh, obviously we're not going to put any of them in a situation where they'd be on safe and so that's right, that's why right, we are, are not working right now but i did uh i did get to do a zoom the other day with laura dern sam neil and jeff goldman oh wow and it was a box it was a box you know you guys have all done zoom so it's a box of four uh and you know you don't think about it every day but when i i saw myself in the fourth box uh it just all hit me at once like <laughs> what is what is that guy doing in the fourth box he does not belong that's steven's box get out of there and I was like, try not, try not to make any, try not, try not to make a goofy smile and, and look like a, a kid who, do, who feels like he snuck in, you know, to their parents' party. 
uh, and I failed. I had a goofy smile the whole time, but uh, they're they're all uh, incredible people, and I'm, I'm so excited uh, to finally be able to get to work with all of them. I don't know if you're aware, Colin, or if you're looking at the Twitch chat right now, but actually a lot a lot of people from the Jurassic fandom have come over here because they're really excited to hear about uh, the new movie. They're all they're all rooting for you and for the next movie in the series. Um, is it is it how fr I mean it's got to be very frustrating for you to be sitting around twiddling your thumbs when you'd rather be directing this movie. Uh, you know, but it's also it's a reality that we all share, and so I think it's just got it's gone beyond any sense of like you know me or or what what I want or, or I think all of us are, are are just super conscious of not just uh, you know the the state of the world, but that we want to make this movie right and we want to make sure we can you know, be in a situation where we're, you know, we're able to really get in there together and, and find each of these moments and, and make sure that it's everything that we want it to be. So I, w I would rather uh, wait until that's possible. Uh, I think that's, I think that's, it. I think it's a very smart answer. Uh, I do, so, since, since so many of your, of your fans and Jurassic Park, uh, Park fans uh, have come into the chat here, I, just want to, like, so I, I, I don't know why, but I typically don't think of like the Jurassic uh, franchise as having kind of a fandom the same way that Star Wars or Star Trek does. But having worked on the movies, you, you, you must be aware that it, that it does. Is it, is it a very passionate fandom? And, and, what's, it, and what's it like, um, you know, working in, in, a, in, a, in a world where you've got those passionate fans? Uh, you know, it's a, I love our fandom. I'm not just saying that because they're listening. Uh, our, our fandom <laughs> is a very, uh, it's a very supportive and open and, and I will say empathetic fandom. And when I say empathetic, it's that they all acknowledge that there are going to be some of the movies that they like and some that they don't and some elements of each one that they like or that they don't. And I feel like our fandom uh, is a place where everybody can have that discourse uh, without, you know, vilifying each other. Uh, for liking something that somebody else doesn't like. Uh, and is, I, I accuse no other fandom of this. I'm just saying our fandom is that way. And I, I really appreciate that. And it seems very um, non-toxic, right? It seems like a very, very kind of wholesome fandom, which is rare, right, in genre fandom. All, all, all fandoms have their kind of toxic elements, but the Jurassic fans, they seem like a really uh, nice bunch of people. I, I don't know all of them personally, but I feel like <laughs> I do at this point. Uh, <laughs> I could just start just, just listing off names. Uh, are they? Are no, they, I, I, um, they? Everyone, has, you know, what, what's been really interesting, like again, since I'm an avatar and I can speak openly, what I have, I, you know, the factions, and there's factions in every brand, in every fandom, and uh, and ours is very specific in that, you know, you have Jurassic Park fans uh, who grew up on that, and then, you know, they all acknowledge that, you know, that Jurassic World had a responsibility to reach out to a new generation of fans. And the things that the franchise has done in order to do that doesn't always jive uh, with like the core tenets uh, every time out of, of the Jurassic Park movies. And I know they know how much I know what those tenets are and I, and I really focus on, on doing everything I can, but I, I found our fans to, to be really understanding of just that fundamental idea that there's a new generation of kids who get to have their own set of Jurassic movies right. uh, and they're not they're not looking to infringe on that experience I remember when I was a, a kid uh, there was a coffee shop uh, called Gaylord's Coffee that was down on uh, in Oakland and I went in there uh, right after Return of the Jedi came out and, and uh, I was pretty fired up about it obviously I was probably six I was with my parents and the guy the guy the barista uh, made some shitty comment about the Ewoks, and, and I was I had no idea I love that there was any problem with the Ewoks. I had no I idea. Love uh, I, I, I love them. I still defend Return of the Jedi. I didn't know, but I remember at that time it was just like, bro, like you may have your issue, but like you know, please, like do not, please don't pollute my perfect uh, relationship with, uh, with Return of the Jedi uh, with the way you see it being a twenty-seven-year-old proto hipster. I, I knew I liked you, Colin. I knew it, and this, and, and this is why. Um, yeah, listen, I, I get into I get into arguments about this all the time. I will I will re I will defend Return of the Jedi and the Ewoks and Yub Nub, all of it, to my dying day. And I'll say it to the, to, to this day, um, even all these decades later, still the Battle of Endor is still the best space battle ever put on film. And in fact, uh, the Battle of Scarif, in many ways, I wrote that battle um, as a tribute to the Battle of Endor. And I don't think it's as good, but we because uh, nothing can ever be as good. But it was very, the whole third act of, of Rogue One was very much influenced by the third act of Return of the Jedi, because I think it's one of the best third acts ever put um, on film. Uh, and I, I get into arguments with fans about this all the time. And I, I don't, don't tell yourself short, sure, man. Third act of Rogue One's pretty dope. It's pretty it's good, pretty but I, part of the reason why it's yep. good is because, you know, we were standing on the shoulders of giants. 
uh, and we were yeah. trying to do something as good as as good as they did. So, Colin, I want to I want to get real with you for a moment. I want I, I really oh. want to talk to you uh, about the book now? of Henry. I want now oh. now's the time to get real. I want to talk to you about the <laughs> book of Henry. I made a joke at the top of the show about uh, After Earth, which is a movie I co-wrote with M Night Shyamalan. And it was very poorly received, both critically and commercially. And people say, to this day, I still get it years later on Twitter. Um, oh, what do you know? You wrote After Earth, lol. And of course, I just ban them and move on. But at the time, back in 2013, when the movie came out, um, the, 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 the degree to which it flopped, both critically and commercially, was really quite agonizing for me. I asked Leah, I was a mess. I was, I was, I was really, up, really upset, really profoundly disappointed, uh, and honestly worried for a while if I was done in the film industry. Fortunately, I wasn't. But for a while there, it really, really affected me. And with The Book of Henry, you had a movie uh, that also uh, was, was poorly received. And some of the reviews I remember at the time are really quite vicious. And I, I just mm. wonder how, if, if you're, how, I want to compare notes with you if your experience was like mine did it did it hit you hard did it cause you to doubt yourself did you just roll with it like what was your reaction when that movie came out and you saw how people responded to it uh, it's complicated man i mean i you know that's a, i loved the script and i loved what that movie had to say and it was about you know watching out for your neighbor and, and not compromising your own ethics in order to fight evil uh, and it's it's the way our you know our children can teach us and guide us but in the end you know they they need us to uh, establish ethical boundaries of right and wrong for them and it's just it's kind of a testament to what I was feeling as a parent at the time so it was very personal uh, and I also wanted to make something small that was close to Vermont so we made it in New York and it was this wonderful shoot and I thought performances were excellent and we just loved making it so it was just this really positive experience up until the release of it. And, 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 uh, and, 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 and then talk me through that. Well, I mean, you know, it, God, what can I say? I mean, it was, uh, it was painful, uh, deeply painful. And, uh, and it, it, what was hard is that it somehow uh, it turned into this existential question about me as a filmmaker. And I, in that moment, uh, you know, obviously, like we all know what was going on at the time, uh, you know, as a result of, of all of the, uh, there were articles, you know, like, you know, because of the book of Henry, uh, you know, should, should I be able to keep the job that I had? Uh, and, you know, it, it was it, the moment for me, I'm a very rational uh, person, very straightforward. And, and that's when it became clear to me that a lot of fans and journalists, honestly, really didn't want me on the mound in the bottom of the ninth uh, for Star Wars. And that was just the reality of it. So I'm right. sitting here talking to my family. I'm like, well, so what do you do, <laughs> you know, in a situation like this? And, you know, when that's the case, you hand over the ball. You know, you're gracious for ever getting a shot in the first place. Uh, and I still am. Uh, but there was there was a lot going on when it came to the way that that movie was received in the context of the movie I'd just done and the movie I was about to do. And, and I can only imagine, you know, if, if I were reading those articles about this, which I probably would have been glued to also, I understand why they were so uh, eminently clickable. It became you know, a bit of a cottage industry for all uh, to, to write about. Oh, I'm very aware. I, yeah, I, I probably yeah. would have been fascinated by it too uh, in the way that, you know, we love, you know, train wrecks and, and reality shows where, you know, where people uh, are, are are knocked down to size. And I think the only thing that, that felt off about it is that I, you know, I, I wasn't really two sides. I just went home to Vermont with my family and made a little movie that I thought was a cool piece of art. And, and if I had any idea that that would be viewed in the context of, of my next job in the way that it was, uh, I, I may not have made it, honestly. I probably would have done things differently. On the flip side, I made it for my wife, and she it's her favorite of my movies, and she loves it, and so it's, it's hard to want to take it back. I hear you. Um, when, when something like that happens, though, I might, my, 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 because you know, I had this with Outer Earth, and I've had lots of other failures in my career, um, I feel like the best thing you can do is, is t take from it and learn from it what you can. Do you feel like you, uh, 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 do you feel like you learned anything from it? Has, has it informed you, you, has it changed you in any way when something like that happens? It's changed me for sure. I don't know if I have like a specific takeaway, but you know, one of the ideas that I really love from Ryan's movie is, you know, that, that failure is a great teacher. And, I love that, and that I love is, that line. You know, I thought it was a beautiful idea and, and that uh, is is what I experienced. And, and I, I will say, you know, it, it made me so grateful for what I have. I think there was also a moment when, you know, I had, I had done Jurassic World and I think I was my ambition was was to make as many different kinds of movies as possible and to not get you know locked into a single franchise and uh, I think now that I, I I think I recognize the gift of of 
of what being part of the Jurassic franchise is uh, more than I think I did. I think there was a little bit of, of uh, oh, I did real good. You guys liked it. I, I, you liked Jurassic World Successful. Can I have this one now? Right. Can I have the thing? Can I have this other shiny thing? And, and uh, you know, and I, I honestly, like, again, me being honest as an avatar, if I had been on the outside looking at that and the guy who dressed Jurassic World is suddenly gets Star Wars, it would have been like, you know, Ronald McDonald gets crowned the Burger King. Like, you don't get to have both. Right. And, and I like, you. I would have hated that guy. I'm like, fuck that guy. Uh, so I got it. And, 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 and uh, I, I just, I could not be, uh, I couldn't be more uh, deeply satisfied and happy that I get to make the movie I'm making right now. I'm glad to hear that. I, um, I stole um, a quote from... I know you guys hear this all the time, uh, but I just want to make it really clear that, like, yeah, it you have to go through all these complicated situations like that uh, and complicated feelings, but there are so many people out there that thoroughly enjoy those movies too. And so it, it's important that you always kind of keep that in the back of your mind too. Like I, I had a blast with After Earth. Book of Henry is so sweet and lovely. And it just, you guys, you need to know that there's tons of people that will always enjoy your your art as you create that's very, that's it. Oh, well, thanks, very, man. That's very sweet, Adam. Thank you for that. I, I want to believe that someday that movie will play a little differently. I, I want to believe that. That if, if people look at it outside of the context of that moment as just a movie, uh, especially after, you know, what's happened in, in our in our country, uh, in our world for the past couple of years, Sometimes I think it, it might play a little while. different. And I, Sometimes yeah, and it I, takes I hope a while for movies I, to come I, of I age. I say that with, without an ounce of, of arrogance. I just hope it does. Uh, but honestly, like, look, if anyone's listening who's going to be a creative person, you know, if you choose that life, uh, this comes with it. You know, sometimes you're going to get into to situations not only where people, uh, you know, don't like the art that you make, uh, but where, you know, you don't you don't see something the same way as someone else. Uh, it's almost inevitable. Uh, and how you deal with situations like that is it's a testament to your character. You know, it goes deep. I agree. I think I think how you how you roll with those punches when things don't go your way is a uh, and I, I often I, I don't think I handled it. I mean, I, like I said, when I when things really, really go against me and I, you know, I've been fired from films, I've had movies closed down like two weeks from production, I've had movies that opened, you know, to terrible reviews and box office. And I, I often don't handle it well. I get very cross and I, I'm, I become unbearable for a little while. It takes me a while to kind of process it. But the um, the main thing, uh, there's a little nugget of wisdom. I steal, I don't come out who, who first said it, but I steal it. Or I use it when I when I do public speaking, and it's really honestly helped me. Um, and it sounds like you know, it sounds like something you know on a you know that you'd see on a bumper sticker, but it really means something to me. Um, uh, this quote: "Success isn't the opposite of failure; it's a part of it." And I think that's really true. Oh, absolutely. I mean, look. I'm sorry, no fa fa I mean, right. is. failure isn't the opposite of success. It's a part of it. And I think that's really true. Yeah. I would, no matter what your job is, uh, things are not always going to go the way you want them to go. Uh, and sometimes you are, I, everyone, and even just in life, you're going to get slammed into the surf and get a mouthful of sand. And then you might get back up and get slammed into the surf again. Right. Uh, what right. defines you is how, how many times you keep getting back up. We've got, a, we've got a clip coming. I'm going to show a little clip. And Universal Pictures are not going to like this, Adam. We're going to get in trouble, but whatever. I've got Colin Trevorrow here. We're going to show the clip. We're going to show a little clip in just a moment from <laughs> Battle at Big, Jurassic World Battle at Big Rock, which is um, uh, Colin's most recent project that people have seen. Just real quick, though, just two, two quick topics I want to touch on before we get to that. I do want to sure. talk to you about video games because yeah. we're, inside, we're inside a video game right now. I love that you're uh. a gamer. You're, more, you're, more kind, you're my kind of people. Colin, tell me yeah. about you and video games. Have you, have you been a video game fan since you were a kid? I was. I didn't really go hard at it until Xbox, uh, which I guess was uh, 2002, like original Xbox. Yeah, 2000. Um, and that, 2000, okay. So that was, I mean, it was Halo was first, and then, you know, Chronicles of Riddick was amazing. There was this game called Circus Maximus that we would just play endlessly. Uh, did you ever play that game? No, I don't think I know that one. Circus Maximus, I don't know why they don't make another one of these. It's a chariot racing game. Uh, and you're able to, one person controls the driver of the chariot, and the other person is, is on the back with like a big axe swinging. Like a Ben Hur kind of thing? It's amazing. And, and like we I would play that. it for days at a time, this game. Yeah, uh, that's a ridiculous game. The game rules. <laughs> uh, but, and there are moments uh, in that game that I think about just the way that, that physics work in that game uh, that I've uh, applied to action sequences ever since. There's just, <laughs> it was amazing. But the, so right now, though, I, you know, I, I have a son who's 11, and so I, I'm experiencing games through him. I pretty much only play with him. Uh, and we, we played Red Dead 2 all the way through to the 
And uh, my wife showed me this video the other day uh, where she caught him. She he was crying because he was playing the song. That's the you know that's the way it is that is in the game. And he was playing it and listening to it and just crying. And she goes up to him, saying, you know, "What's going on?" And there's this video of him being like, "It's." And then you hear the voices of all of his friends telling him he's a good man, wrestling with a giant. Like he was emotionally completely distraught by the way that this song evoked a memory of a video game. And that to me felt like we'd stepped into it. You know, and that's probably every developer's dream is that you could have the kind of effect, uh, emotional effect on a player that a filmmaker could have on a, on a viewer. I mean, I don't want to get into a whole sidebar because I want to, I want to get to our next guest uh, very yeah. soon. Uh, but no, I mean, I think, I think, you know, we, we reached and crossed the point where video games are clearly uh, able, as able to be a, a, as emotionally affecting as film or literature or any other medium. I think that ship sailed a long time ago. We've been there for a while. Wouldn't you agree, Colin? Yeah, it just depends on on, uh, on what moves you. Uh, but yes, absolutely. Now, um, we're going to go to the Battle of Big Rock Clipper. Next, and right after that, we're going to bring on our next guest, who's actually a surprise guest. She got added I so guess. late. So late, we didn't have time to promote her appearance, but she's but she's waiting patiently uh, upstairs and in the Discord, and she's going to be coming on in just a moment. But I have two things before she comes on: we're going to show the battle at Big Rock clip. We're going to get in trouble with Universal Pictures. Whatever, they can call me. Um, but I but first I think of all, they're probably like, going to call me. We but go ahead. Um, okay, listen. We we joke we joke we joke <laughs> <laughs> we joked around uh, at the top of the show about the elephant in the room. But I do want to get serious for a moment. We do have to address, I think, the movie that did actually just come out this past Christmas. Obviously, it was very controversial. It totally split the fan base. Everyone's been asking me on Twitter like, ever since it came out, like, what do you think of the movie? What do you think of the movie? I'm, I, I know that people have been curious to know what you think about it. I'm curious to know if we agree. So Colin Trevorrow, I have to ask you, what did you think of Cats? Uh, you. I, I'm gonna give a sincere answer. Uh, <laughs> Man, I loved the trailer, and I, I like went public with how much I loved the trailer. I thought it looked like a like a bizarro surrealist dance film that I would be like super down with, free of irony. Uh, I love big swings, um, and especially like on the level where you have to make hundreds of millions of dollars to justify the cost, uh, and for them to do something that is not a guaranteed win, uh, I think is an attempt at making art. And you know, maybe people won't like your art, uh, but it's still art. So I cheer the big swing. Uh, even if it didn't go the way people might have wanted. I, uh, I, 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 I could not agree with you more. I said it, uh, we went to a press screening and I, I genuinely, unapologetically, and I, I, I did a video review of it. We sang the theme tune from memory, which I'm not gonna uh, uh, curse you with right now. We did that already. We lost half our audience over that clip. I still don't regret it, by the way. Um, <laughs> Um, but I, genu I genuinely enjoyed it. Uh, the, the music obviously is beautiful. And like, and, and like you, Colin, I really appreciate the fact that maybe, maybe they missed, but they took a swing and they took a big swing. And I admire that. I admire any kind of artistic uh, high wire act where this could go horribly wrong, but maybe it goes right. And that's how some of the best art in history has been made. I remember when, when I was working with Knight on After Earth, you know, there's a scene in his movie, uh, signs where if you remember the Joaquin Phoenix character uh, used to play baseball and he has two records he has one record for the most number of home runs uh, ever hit in the ballpark mm -hmm. but he also has the record for the most number of strikeouts mm -hmm. and as I was working with Knight I realized that that was a metaphor for his filmmaking mm -hmm. sometimes he hits a home run sometimes he strikes out but he always always takes a big swing and I really admire that I agree I agree and what I admire the most is that he is not when a filmmaker uh, doesn't become like a kicked puppy after taking too many swings that miss and they keep they keep taking the swings like that takes uh, a certain amount of grit uh and resilience that not everybody has uh and in fact most people don't and, and i really not just admire that about him but but a, a, any filmmaker who has kept going uh you know after after being slammed into the surf. I couldn't agree more. We're gonna to get to our next guest right after this. She's almost ready to come on, but and, and, and actually this clip is gonna tee her up. Our surprise guest is connected to the clip we're about to show. So Colin, in after Jurassic World, which you directed, and uh, and then Jurassic World uh, uh, Fallen Kingdom. Fallen Kingdom, yeah. Uh, which was, sorry, I'm blanking. Remember, remind me the name of the director of J.O. Bayona. J.O. Right? Bayona. J.O. Bayona directed Fallen yeah. Kingdom. You then returned to the franchise and, and, and directed, and no one saw this coming, this cool little 10 minute short film called Jurassic World Battle at Big Rock. How did this project yeah. come about? Uh, I still don't really understand how we how it happened, but uh, somehow uh, I convinced Universal to give us 
uh, some money to go make a short film in between the two movies. Uh, and I, for me, like on a personal level, you know, first of all, it's it's the most um, kind of unfettered uh, piece of me. Like the way I, what I feel about Jurassic Park, the very essence of it is in this short. Uh, and you know, when you make the big movies, there's, there's such a massive audience, and there's so many different kinds of, of uh, tastes that need to be fulfilled. And you know, it's a lot of masters to serve. But with this, uh, I was able to just do something that got me you know, just back to, to the basics of it, uh, of, of what makes me love it in the first place. So uh, it was cathartic for me. It was, it gave me a chance to work with Emily Carmichael as we were warming up to, to do the film, to do Dominion. Uh, and I just loved it. Uh, I loved the whole experience. And, and uh, I thank them again for, for going along with it. I'm actually dropping that link into the chat right now. If you want to go watch the entire 10 minute short, Battle at Big Rock, um, that's in the, um, uh, in the chat right now. So Colin, that's amazing. I, I watched the whole thing. It's amazing. Give me, give me a little signal. We're going to bring on the next guest right after this. We're like 60 seconds out. But give me like a 60 second uh, Colin Trevorrow film school. Like how do you even go about planning and staging and figuring out how to, how to shoot a scene like that? Oh my, well that particularly, I mean, we, we built a model of, of, uh, of that trailer and we had dinosaur toys and uh, we would basically move the dinosaur toys around the model and have them eat little action figures. So is that, that probably is a lot more simplistic than what you were hoping to hear. <laughs> I, I, but, but, I but I love that the principle is the same, whether you're goofing around with a shoebox and some action figures or like a, you know, $200 million worth of visual effects. The, the principle it's is true. the same, right? It just scales We up. also, we will, in a cool, another thing, once we did that, we also did, we did our pre in VR. So I was in a VR volume uh, on a set where I was, I got to handhold the camera in VR and actually shoot uh, the whole thing myself handheld in that space um, as opposed to rendering it uh, as a traditional previs, uh, which was extremely cool and stuff that we're, we're gonna be expanding on doing that in, uh, in Dominion as well. It's a really cool, really exciting tool. It's amazing. It's 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 so so cool. Um, and yeah, the links in the chat if anyone wants to go check out the whole uh, clip. And the great thing about that clip was it kind of does tee up our second guest, who's going to be coming down the stairs in just a moment. So that short, uh, um, Colin, you co-wrote that with a very talented young screenwriter named Ella Emily Carmichael, and she in fact is also now your screenwriter, uh, your co-writer on the upcoming Jurassic World Dominion. How did you two, um, well, you know, let's do that. Let's bring it down. Let's like, why her why, why are we yeah, making her, her wait her any longer? Colin, if you'd be so good, uh, please scooch down, scooch down the couch in classic uh, talk show <laughs> talk show tradition. There we go. Uh, let's bring on our second this. guest. She's a very, very talented uh, young screenwriter. And now she's super duper hit the big time uh, as the co-writer of the upcoming Jurassic World uh, Dominion. Please welcome to Animal Talking, Emily Carmichael. <laughs> Emily, thank you. Come take a seat here on the couch. She's doing some emotes. Here she, here she comes. There we go. Oh, first time. Professional. Hit, hitting, hitting, the, hitting her mark on the couch first time. Emily, welcome to the show. Uh, it's great to be here. Now, you said that this was your basement. Can yes, you it's give the, a, it, like what? I'm, I'm not, I don't play Animal Crossing, so what does a normal Animal Crossing basement look like? This used to look kind of like a bit of a sad man cave. I had... Um, uh, video arcade games and foosball tables and pinball oh, machines and train sets down basement. here. It's like a big overgrown child's basement, basically. And yeah, this, uh, this whole show came about because after I got bored with that, because you can't actually play the arcade games, uh, I thought, well, let's try to do something else. And that's how the talk show set came about. It's super great. It's super creative. Thank you. Thank you. We, we really enjoy We're really having fun with it. Now, I, I also want to talk to you about the outfit that you've picked out to wear on the show. Uh, yeah. You, uh, I, I can't help but notice that uh, we got a little Cloud Strife Final Fantasy oh, VII yeah. thing going on here. Well, I, I, and thank you, the wardrobe department, your wardrobe department was incredible. We are playing the Final Fantasy VII remake in my household. Uh, so it's me and my partner and his two kids. So like introducing the game to the next generation has been really wonderful. It's one of you know my favorite games growing up. Uh, the Final Fantasy series means means a lot to me. It was one of my like I think big influences as a as a writer as a director. Um, Final Fantasy C seven like no no less than than any of them. I was obsessed with that game. Um, and the remake's great. The remake's great. We played I it. I got it. I got to get to it. It's installed on my PlayStation four. I'm desperate to play. I never played the original, so I'm so excited to play the remake. But on Animal Crossing. 
thing. It's taken up all my time. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I've got no free time. Uh, yeah, for sure. That's what I mean. I keep seeing all the memes about Animal Crossing. I, I, but I really want to play Final Fantasy VII. Now, I also understand that in the wardrobe process, Emily, you were a little bit of a diva. I sent one picture to Colin and said, is this avatar okay? He said, yes, yeah, signed off on it. You went through a very protracted process with, with Adam, uh, sending endless notes and, and costume changes until, until we got it just the way you wanted it. Oh, text. I am a monster. <laughs> I plan. I do plan to have, um, you know, because it's my my job. I, I do plan to have a lot of screenwriters uh, on the show because it's something I can, you know, talk to people about. Uh, we've actually got some really good ones booked on the show uh, coming up. I'm not going to say who yet because we only reveal uh, the guests on the next show during the current show. Uh, but we do have some really really uh, talented screenwriters uh, coming up uh, very soon. Um, Emily, I actually, we, this is not the first time we met. I don't know, you probably don't remember because you were whizzing around and very in demand. I at do Aust remember. Uh, you remember? Are you we sure? We were on a panel together. We were on a panel together at Austin Film Festival last year in the before times when people were still allowed to congregate in the outside world. Uh, it was fun and that was what I remember. I remember sitting there and listening to you as you were uh, talking and, and answering questions from the moderator and from, from the people in the audience. And I remember thinking, wow, she really knows what she's, I mean, not that I, not that I had any other expectation, but I was just really impressed. Uh, you just seemed like a very very talented and a very lovely person which is why uh colin did not need to twist my arm at all uh to have you on the show how did you get into screenwriting i came to screenwriting how did i get into screenwriting so i have been a writer since forever since forever since i was like a little little kid and i have been sort of drawing and painting and sculpting since forever um like my whole life like in sixth grade, I had this big breakdown and I like was crying to my mom because I thought that my creative output in fifth grade had been superior uh, when I was like super stressed out about it. She was super cool, actually. I will never uh, forget how chill she was in that moment. She was like, um, she's like, you know, I'm not a creative person in the same way that you are a creative person, but I do know some creative people and I do kind of get the sense that it comes in waves. So sometimes when I freak out about stuff, I just remember my mom saying it comes in waves. So I've had a lot of big waves, I guess, of um, things that I've been into in my life. When I was little, it was, you know, fiction writing and drawing and painting and sculpting and then putting them together in cartoons. So I did a, I've done a lot of cartoons in my life. I had a cartoon called WizKids, which I should put online at some point. It was, it was, you know, before the internet was a thing. So it exists in many, many, many pieces of paper that are in a we're box. Gonna, we're actually going to show a clip of one of your little uh, uh, web projects uh, yeah. coming out soon. But like, what, what did your first kind of screenplays I mean I, I go back like you know I started when I was like 16 17 years old writing these awful awful screenplays terrible big science fiction epics that I, I still have copies of them and I just cringe when I look oh. at them and it kind of reminds me how far I've come but I was basically punching well above my weight writing these huge huge movies that no one no one was ever going to make from a baby writer like me it's plus the fact they were terrible um but like what do you do you, do you still remember the first uh, film screenplays that that you kind of wrote to, to to hone your craft what were they like Oh, hells yes. I mean, I wrote, I wrote, was, was writing fiction when I was like little. I, I had an unfinished fantasy novel um, when I was 12. Um, it was very, you know, very serious, very, very grown up in its themes. I thought I was like a real, real big shot. I like knew, knew about everything at that point. Um, and then writing scripts, the first sort of scripts that I wrote were probably scripts for class plays. Um, so I remember, yeah, I had one where it's like, a, it was like a fantasy real life mashup. So I'm big into like fantasy real life mashup. That's like one of my sort of uh, core themes. The one of the I think we're going to see a little bit of that in one of the clips that we've got coming up, actually. Totally. Um, and it was just about somebody, it was about a school kid who had to complete a difficult assignment over the course of a school day during which they were also for some reason being hounded by Jason and the Argonauts. Uh, and that was the screenplay. So that was, you know, that was probably my first, my first. I would script. watch that movie. Why aren't they making that movie? You should go back and rewrite that. Actually, I just got to get in, pitch that some places that could really kill. And what? And then, okay. So and then, what was your what was your big break? Was it? Did you have a spec sale? Like, did you win a con competition? Like, what? What? How did you first start to get noticed in the? In so the film I business? was doing. Um, so my shorts were sort of killing it on the festival circuit. Um, so I had been to uh, Sundance and Slamdance and you know AFI and like tons of other festivals. Um, I had optioned a script. Fox Digital had optioned um, a script that I wrote. Uh, but my my big break came when I met Colin. I met Colin. I uh, finished. I finished a screenplay. I finished a screenplay called Eon that I'd been working on for a really long time. I sent it to him. He sent it to his buddy Steven Spielberg, who liked it. How and, handy! You know, how how convenient is that? His buddy. Everything. Um, 
Yeah, so it's been, you know, it's been the ride of a lifetime and I couldn't be more grateful. There's a, and I, I just want to point out a nice little message from the chat. Le Doodle Mime in the chat says, if you cringe at your past, it means you have grown. I think that's quite wise. <laughs> I like that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal that. I, I steal everything, but I mean, we all, we all steal in this business. I'm certainly stealing that one. Thank you, Ladoodle Mine. Um, okay, so that gets you kind of working in the business, but like, what gets you called up to like the big leagues, Jurassic World, dinosaurs? Like, like what, it, what, what gets you noticed basically by a Hollywood titan like Colin Trevorrow? So I like, I, I like arrived in town. You know, so I had like, I had been meeting at Amblin because Spielberg had read my scripts. Um, I was, uh, you know, working on a movie called Powerhouse, a movie that me and Colin had a while back. Um, and then, and at that point it was like, you couldn't, like that was definitely not enough. Like Colin could not have hired me on the basis just of those things. I really needed to prove that I could, you know, write an action adventure in a big way. Um, and I think a big part of that was the script for the black hole that I wrote for Disney. Ooh, um, I, one of my favorite, you know, I love the fact that you can get that again now on Disney plus. You totally you don't again. You don't have to buy it on iTunes anymore. Um, I will talk up that script to the end of time. Uh, it has not been shot. Uh, I don't think it, it has. Any we've plans all we've all been there, right? We all wrote the script. We all wrote. Like, for me, it was Mouse Guard, right? We all wrote the adaptation for the big property that we love, and it didn't get made, and it's just always going to be a thorn in our side because we know it was a good script, right? Yeah, and I'm not like I'm not going to stop talking about it. Like, doesn't matter. Production what schedule. Would, so, so, get, so give us a little preview. Give, what was your take on the black hole? Like, how, like for example, like you, you, we know this as screenwriters, you have to go into the studio and pitch them. You have to expl you have to sell them on why your approach to the movie is going to be the right approach. What was your pitch to remake the? Black Hole. Well, so the Black Hole, um, you know, the project has a long history. Uh, there's a great, there's a really interesting draft by Travis Beecham. Um, there's a really interesting draft by John Spates. John Spates uh, did a draft. Yeah, that's right. My good yeah, friend John. Yeah, that's, you know, that's, you know, that's free to share because that's totally, totally announced, totally public. Um, and I think that both of those writers, I think that they would both say, I know John would say that like he loved the movie. He loved it. He, he put his heart into it. Um, Travis wrote a draft. So the, the the pitch for the story is that the um, the empath, the sort of psychological doctor who is on the journey in the original adventure is a woman named Kate McRae. And in the original movie, uh, there's this sort of like offhand aside that somebody says like, oh, your father was on this ship. Unfortunately, he has died. Um, and she like emotes for a second. And that's sort of like all that's ever said about that character. Um, so the way in which the movie was like revisioned um, is that Kate McRae uh, is a captain. She, uh, somebody who lost her dad on a dangerous space adventure when she was very young, spent her whole life um, sort of looking up to him and trying to emulate him or trying to emulate her idea of him. Uh, and then when she's a grown up, she's in charge of her own spaceship. They get a message that he might still be alive. Um, so she has to voyage into space to rescue him. And Travis had a draft um, that was like very heavy on the sci-fi. Um, there were like lots of invented things. I don't think it took place on Earth. I think, you know, it took place on like Eris Prime or something like that. Um, in which Kate McRae um, was kind of like troubled, hard drinking and troubled. And um, John Spates had a draft where uh, Kate McRae was very like upright and um, upright and admirable. Um, and the producer, um, Justin Springer, who I love, who I love very dearly, um, you know, had been in development on, on, on the process for a while, looking for something to kickstart it. Um, and I said to him, I, we had a meeting, I said something in his office. He was like, well, you know, tell me what kind of projects to call you back on, because it's been great talking to you. I would love for us to work together. Tell me what you're interested in. Uh, and this is actually for anybody who, you know, is getting started in the industry or wants to get started in the industry. Uh, when they ask you that question, don't say anything, even though... <laughs> The real answer is probably anything. You have to say something specific because the person uh, that you're in the meeting with is not going to remember that you said that you were interested in everything because that's not memorable. Right. So just say very specific. And the very specific thing I said is like uh, any movie where people um, are sort of shooting lasers at each other and cracking wise in space. <laughs> um, that's that's and, my favorite genre too. <laughs> yeah, totally. That's what I said. Sometimes these days I say uh, any movie in which there is a character, large or small, who might be described as a female Han Solo. So that's like my... <laughs> <laughs> like that's if that's in the movie I want to write the movie um, so then like from that came the idea that like maybe this character is not hard drinking and troubled maybe she's not upright uh, and admirable maybe she's something in between you know maybe she's um, a little fun and daring and doesn't play by the rules uh, and from from that idea that that's was is what I was writing from I just want to so, know, one, as, as a particular Black Hole fan, you know, I have my favorite things about the movie, so I just need to ask you one thing. Did your version have Maximilian and the sad little trash can robots? Because that was oh, my favorite thing about the movie. Yes. 
oh yes and there were actually i learned something in this process because there were you know the movie went through a few drafts uh in one draft the robots were like a little sketched in they sort of like weren't you know quite fully developed and then i got in there and developed the shit out of those robot characters the robot subplot is like one of the richest and most interesting parts of the movie and i realized that if the robots in your sci-fi movie are not the best part of the movie oh so you true are doing something wrong right you feel me on this right everybody i mean it's true it's true in star wars the robots are always everyone's totally favorite is. characters it totally is and if they're not if they're not it's like you've messed up and you've, you've messed up to, you need to revise um yeah, maximilian we did i did i pulled that trick um this is also i'm like giving away all my secrets right now sometimes if you want to reboot a property and make it seem like fresh and maybe make it seem like maybe the original is like hokey and you want to seem like a little more like um I don't know, a little dressed up, a little cooler. You just put a definite article in front of it. So in the original, the robot is called Maximilian, like it's a name. Um, and in the remake, it was gonna be called The Maximilian. Oh, that's a cool tip. I'm gonna write that down. And sometimes like people that. say the Maximilian unit or they shorten it to the Maximilian. I, I should just have screenwriters and directors on all the time, Adam, so I can just steal all their all their tips and tricks. This is maybe the, the new point of the show. So if it has a definite article, <laughs> Take it away, and if it doesn't have a definite article, try one on and see how it works. I love it. I love it. What's it like working with Colin Trevorrow? He is a dream. He is a dream. He is just the, the nicest, funnest guy. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm glad. I'm glad that you know when we get to sit here, like, hang out uh, and chat about this stuff. That like, you know, he is um, the most down to earth, uh, encouraging great creative partner that there could be. I love it. Um, I, uh, Colin, and, and to you, what's it like working with Emily? It's like working with a very highly educated child, like one of those <laughs> kids who went to Harvard but never stopped playing. Uh, and and it's, uh, it's you know, the, when I thought, you know, I thought about what kind of a partner I needed for the long haul in this movie, uh, I needed two things. One is that I felt sort of the same way that I know Stephen looked at me, is that I needed a child in an adult body. Uh, and then I also needed someone who was going to be with me to the absolute end, uh, to the last, last word on the very last page. Oh, yes. uh, and Emily has been that. Uh, all, every step of the way, the level of just just commitment to to making this everything that we, we know and believe it could be. Uh, it's been an amazing collaboration and, and also like, you know, just being able to see her out there succeeding on her own. I mean, she's right. What are you doing? Like three different things right now? Oh, we're mm -hmm. going to get to that in just a second. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's that's what's exciting. She's, she has a completely a career independent of our collaboration. And then when we get to do something like this together, it's uh, it's. It's been Emily, when um, when uh, when Colin compares you to a highly educated child, I hope you take that in the spirit in which I'm sure it was intended, which is just just complimentary. I think that's what he meant. I think so. I mean, look, like a lot of us in this industry, I'm in this having this experience that all of those things that I thought were detriments growing up have like finally found a home. And oh, they find finally pay off. Yeah, and they find, all, I mean, all the things that got me beat up in school are now paying off. I love it. Exactly, and it's the best feeling. It's you know the feeling of of finally being able to be yourself and finally maybe all of those things that you you know were so down on yourself for and that other people were always <laughs> were always chiding you for maybe maybe they're not so bad and maybe they're the source of your power i love it and i and i and i agree with also with what colin said though. like when you find someone that you really kind of creatively vibe with and you're collaborating uh it's the best feeling in the world in fact i'm not going to reveal too much right now but i'm actually um writing a movie right now with one of my favorite screenwriters he's very very graciously agreed to co-write a movie with me i'm not going to say who it is or what we're doing uh because it's too early to announce but i'm just having a blast doing it because we're totally having a great time working with one another but listen the show is this about the, is that is that the twins reboot you're working on yeah triplets <laughs> <laughs> colin what do you think would you would, would, would you direct think, would you direct the, the, the twins sequel triplets would you be down for that a little bit of comedy get, Ar get arnold and, and uh, devito back together and maybe add who like add add the third person <laughs> take the comedy to the next. It would be 33% funnier than the previous movie. I oh, guarantee I guarantee there is a writer out there actually working on that for money right now. Nothing so surprises me anymore. <laughs> but in this business for 20 years, <laughs> nothing surprises me. I don't bat, I don't bat an eyelid. When they, when they told me they were making, a, and I'm, I'm making this up, when they told me they were making a trilogy of films out of Tetris, I didn't bat an eyelid. Because I've seen it all. I've seen it all at this point. <laughs> Um, but Emily, you are actually working on some really cool stuff. The one thing, and, and you taught me how to pronounce the word, so I'm going to try and get it right. For, I've been saying it wrong, apparently, all these years. Um, 
I, no, I'm, I'm still going to get it wrong because I forgot what you taught me. I'm going to ask, okay, you are working. I used to say Naruto, and I know now that's right. It's Naruto? Is that right? Naruto. Naruto, huh? you are working on the live action feature film adaptation of one of the most popular manga and anime properties of all time, Naruto. How, that, that's amazing. Were you a Naruto fan before you uh, dived into that world? I've become a Naruto fan. Uh, one of my partners is super into Naruto. The other is like glancingly into Naruto. So it's become sort of our, our, our household brand. Uh, Cal is really getting on me to complete the series as opposed to watching um, the, the big chunk of the series that was relevant to the arc of the story that's being told in the film. Because like, as you would expect, the film is uh, really an origin story for the character. Uh, it was such a great process. I am so excited for that movie uh, on the basis of what I've seen, on the basis of like who I've worked with on it. So yeah, go. Like, I think it's in, it's in good hands. Fans will be psyched. People who are not fans will become fans. It's and of, great. And, and of course, in, in great animal talking tradition, Adam, right as Emily starts dropping all this amazing knowledge about Narado and the chat is freaking out, I think we might have actually broken some cool news here. Her, her Discord audio starts going a bit wonky. You know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's of course, that's what happens. Um, so I'm very excited about that. I'm very excited about uh, Narado. I know you're also working on a project called uh, Delilah Dirk for Disney, right? Which is an adaptation yeah. of a popular uh, novel or series of books. Yes, yes. Um, it's based on a graphic novel. It's a swashbuckling adventure in the Ottoman Empire in the 1800s. It's about a lady sword slinger who teams up with sort of a mild-mannered Turkish janissary, and they're an odd couple with opposite personalities, and they get swept up to a grand adventure. Um, it's it's super great. Um, and I'm really, really excited about it, and it really speaks to sort of like what I, oh my God, can I just say it? So my, my partner is... Um, uh, Eric Sayer, which if you have watched a movie on the internet of accents, right. uh, a very handsome, agreeable man uh, explains movie accents to you and like talks about accent uh, performers. That's Eric Sanger. He just came in to our little sound booth that we have in our home to adjust my microphone for me. Thank you. Oh, and, and now the wonkiness <laughs> has gone away. What what was the problem on your end? You, how did he fix that? No idea. He well, he fixed it. He fixed it. Um, um, we're back. We're back in business. Um, the other thing that I find fascinating. Um, um, and by the way, do you have any? Uh, where, uh, again, because uh, obviously people, people love that. We got a lot of anime fans in the chat. Apparently, um, uh, when, when, are we, where are you in, in that process? And when, when, when? Of course, you never know in this business. But when, when might we see uh, that movie? I think you know. I think I'm, I'm probably not at liberty to say much. Um, I do want to just. Um, yeah, I just want to want to say what a what how great it's been, what a ride it's been. Um, I don't want to to share any share any secrets that I'm not at liberty to share. No, quite quite right too. You're you're a professional. You've been doing this long enough to know that uh, loose looks sick ships. Even even when you're a cartoon cloud strife in an Animal Crossing basement, the, your words carry weight. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> we're gonna bring our excuse me cough button. We're gonna bring our musical guest Ryan Miller. <laughs> from the band Gusta in on uh, on in just a couple of minutes. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a little bit of Hollywood magic here on Animal Talk. And what we do is we're gonna play a clip from um, Emily's uh, uh, next, or uh, one of her previous projects that I think is really cool. And I wanted to show just a minute of And While we're watching that clip, uh, Ryan Miller uh, from Gusta is gonna move himself into position over in Adam's band. Ad Adam's gonna be ejected from his band area. Uh, we're gonna bring, a, bring in a proper musician. Someone who actually knows how to use those instruments is gonna come in. I more than support this. Yeah, I, I think I, I think we all do. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna play. So Emily, what a small world we had. We had Jerry Holkins and Mike Krahulik uh, just uh -huh. the other night, actually on our like, most recent show on Wednesday. And you mentioned to me that actually one of your earliest projects was was a project that ended up on Penny Arcade, The Adventures of Lido and Ix. This is kind yep. of what you did early in your career, right? You did these cute little um, uh, I don't want to call them machinimas or whatever. These little animations where you took kind of the graphic style of like classic Super Nintendo, like JRPGs, like Chrono Trigger and stuff like that, and and turn them into these cute little narratives. I'd never seen these before, but they're really adorable. How did, how, like, what was the idea behind that? You know, um, I had just, I was a film student. I had just made the most expensive short movie I had ever made. I was totally burned out. I was burned out uh, from asking people for favors and to lend me things, which is what you have to do when you're making an independent movie. And I wanted to do something really small. And I just thought about uh, being a kid and playing Final Fantasy II when Tella, uh, what happens? Tella, no, the two twins, ah, 
the two twins, these magic twins, they turn themselves to stone. You're in, your party enters a room. The stone walls of the room are closing in on you. These two lighthearted twins who have been just sort of like bantering and fun and sparkles and magic uh, look to each other and an unspoken agreement passes between them. All of this is happening in eight bits. Uh, and they walk to opposite sides of the room and they say the fateful word stone. And they turn themselves to stone, halting the walls of the room so that your party can survive. Um, and it's like all in like little pixels and I'm like crying. Um, my life has changed by this. Um, so I wanted to make something like that. I wanted to um, sort of explore what is the smallest amount of information that you need to have an emotion um, and to have an emotional connection to a character. I, uh, I'm going to play a little clip, not from Lido and Nix, but from this other thing that you sent me called RPG OKC. It Which says is here. Spin off. Spin off says, to Lido and Nix. So you now it says here, okay, directed, written, and animated by, uh, by Emily Carmichael, so you did it all yourself. This was an official selection at the Tribeca Film Festival in 2013, and in fact won Best Short Film at the Philadelphia Film Festival that same year. That's that's amazing. Yep, 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 yeah. My, my, my uh, short films, you know, if you make it, if you can sort of bust into the short film circuit, and especially if you have, uh, you know, something that sort of stands out from the marketplace, because I was the only person making 8-bit movies with uh, Super Nintendo characters in them, um, <laughs> you can really, you can really sort of get in there and stay in there for a while, um, which is really nice. So that was sort of like my 20s were going to film festivals and meeting people at film festivals um, and meeting, you know, like meeting Anna Kerrigan, who is the writer and director who ultimately introduced me and Colin. So that that's really like how wow. I how I got to start. So this opened this 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 little uh, short film opened a lot of doors for you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, no, it. actually, I'm gonna no? I'm actually gonna revise that because okay. it was a combination. It was the combination of this and like all of the other um, short films that I had made. And I do think whenever I have a chance to like talk to young people about how they're budgeting their creative time, um, this idea that it's like one this one big project that then that's gonna be your big break is probably not the idea. Um, it's gonna be the sum of things that you've done. Um, it's gonna be you know each individual project has just a small chance of being the super important thing. So think about a workflow where you can maximize the swings that you can take. If you can like figure out how to spend a small amount of time on five projects that might be better spent than spending all of that time on a single project. Emily, you so are wise beyond your years. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm gonna sh I'm gonna show um, just a minute of this of this of this film that Emily's been talking about. It really show like it's like the whole thing is like um, ten minutes long, and showing just the first minute of it is really not gonna do it justice. So when we're done here, I'm gonna drop the link into the chat. You should all go check it out. This is Emily's uh, award-winning uh, film festival film that she made, and I think it's just adorable, you know, because it's video games. It's it's very very on brand uh, for animal talking. I'm gonna I'm gonna mute the capture card. Uh, because I'm going to leave it muted for a while because we're going to show this clip. Um, and then when we come back, Ryan Miller from Gusta uh, is going to perform. So but like right now, let's go to the clip and just look at a little bit, uh, just a, a brief minute of uh, Emily's uh, short film from 2013. Not yet. Yeah. Just making sure. So that was just just one minute, and it really, it really I watched the whole thing. It really that first minute really doesn't do it justice. And so I'm going to put the cl the link for the whole thing uh, into the chat. Um, and let me see, where's my chat? There it is. I'm going to drop it in there right now. If you want to check out Emily's short film, it's on Vimeo. The whole thing is there. Uh, but now, now it is time uh, for our musical guest, and I'm so so excited about this. This 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 came together incredibly quickly. Uh, we love. We love musical guests uh, on this show, and uh, we discovered when the, the lovely and talented Raquel Lilly uh, performed here last week that people just freak out when we have live music on the show. And so um, 
we were very lucky to get just an incredibly talented artist by the name of Ryan Miller. You heard just a moment ago just how eager he is to perform. He can't wait to get started. Uh, we're going to we're going to go to him right now, singing uh, not just an original song, performing a brand new song he literally just wrote this week for the very first time, premiering it for the very first time on Animal Talking. Please welcome and take it away, Ryan Miller. I'm not frightened out of you, you black balloon. My sun, my moon. Yeah. Wow. My goodness. Wow. Wow. I love that song so much. That New song. Oh. Written wow. this week. Unbelievable. Thanks, thanks, Ryan, thanks, Ryan, thanks, please thanks come and please come and join us on the Animal Talking Couch. <laughs> come come and join us. Come and join I'm ready, us. I'm ready for my avatar close up. Oh yeah. Um we're gonna we, yeah, yeah, we always have to do a little bit of musical chairs here to get everyone seated uh on the couch correctly. <laughs> we're, we're getting you all good. into position right now. There I we look go. We very can do it. Stonery. <laughs> There we go. You can do it, Ryan. You can do it. There we go. There, there we go. That's almost worth, a, worth another round of applause all by itself. Uh, Ryan, rightly so. Everyone in the chat is just freaking out at that performance. That was amazing. That was amazing. And you and you and, and you're not kidding around. You literally, first of all, you performed that live, right? That wasn't a pre-recorded track. You performed that live from your home studio. Yeah. Remember when I was talking in the middle of Emily's clip? <laughs> <laughs> Remember me playing? That was me. That was me thinking that I was. And that, you know what? And, and, and that little, and that little, me. that that little screw up, I think, actually proved that we were really, really doing it live. Because if it was just an MP3, that wouldn't have happened. Exactly. I love that. Well, that's I love what I'm that. here for. A little verisimilitude for everyone today. And not that's my. You know, that's one of my favorite words, verisimilitude. Mine too. I, I can't word. stop using I, it. I love it. I use it all the time. Um, and not only, and not only did you perform that live, really, you you really did just write that this week. That's brand new material that our audience heard for the very first time well because you and i were talking earlier in the week and i was like i've been doing a few of these live casts and i've been, you know i do some of the guster stuff and i've been doing a lot of covers and it's been an experience for me to learn some stuff so like i learned some but then we were talking about copyright stuff and i was like well shoot i don't want you to get dinged for copyright things right. and i was like oh maybe i'll just play a guster song but then i called my manager he's like oh you might even get dinged for that and i was like well the only way to not get dinged is just to play a song no one's ever heard before right so i had, so i was sort of working on this song and i had some ideas and and i was like well i always need assignments so i was like well if i just say i'm gonna do this then i'll finish the lyric and i'll just figure out how to do it. So uh, that's what I like doing in this whole time is I need little assignments. That's why I love scoring films and being in a band and doing all that stuff as I need it. So this was an assignment. So that was I good. Love... I'm glad it went okay. No, it was brilliant. And like, you know, we, we, we crossed a barrier last week on the show when we had Raquel Lilly perform music live on the show for the first time. And we crossed another one now when we had like a major music, musical artist actually debut a brand new piece of material for the first time on the show. And I think already, uh, Ryan, you've, you've won over a lot of fans and we're going to be talking about your new album uh, in just a couple of moments. The copyright thing is funny because when we did our sound checks and when we talked, we didn't want to, we don't want to get a copyright strike, but you did. And I'm, by the way, I'm not twisting your arm to do it now or anything. I'm just bringing it up. Uh, you did for us a, a cover version of the Beach Boys classic, God Only Knows. And Adam and I were just, it was just, I don't know why you thought that like you, that wasn't like your best the the, the, be the song that you're best at because it was incredible and it was wonderful. And I said to you at the time, like, I'll take the copyright claim for you to sing that on the show because it was so good. <laughs> It was so That's good. Some kind of weird digital, like get, I'll take a bullet for you. It's like I, I'll well, take I, I, would, I would jump in front of the copyright bullet <laughs> so that you could that you could perform that uh, on the show. It was it was really incredible. Uh, I hope we, I, I hope that you do it for us sometime. Maybe you'll come back again uh, and do it sometime. Because uh, I, I, I mean, this has been this has been so uh, this has been great. I've I've enjoyed. I mean, I haven't been watching, but this is a you're a great interviewer. This is a great. And Emily, we we met only once before, but like and hearing Colin, but I do I know Colin pretty well. But you're right though. Like 
taking yourself out of the camera and just putting yourself into a microphone, I think uh, amps up the, the vulnerability of this whole thing, especially taking the video element. Out. I just like, just like AOC. I'm like, I'm intrigued enough by how right. It's just, it's just, it's, it's just so it's, it's so crazy. It just might work. And it has, it has been just kind of working by the way, I do need to compliment um, my wife and executive producer, uh, I don't know if you can see it right now, um, uh, Ryan, but I thought she did an incredible job on your avatar. Not only did she capture your likeness, but just so you're aware of the amount of effort she put into this, she went and built and created a custom T-shirt design for you based on the cover uh, of one of your early, <laughs> Gusta's early albums. Yeah, that's that's some iconic OG uh, Gusta right stuff right there. Oh, <laughs> oh look, yeah. I'm haloed. I'm haloed. Capture card um, back on. Yeah, we got to have my the, KK slider jazz. Um, speaking of KK Slider, uh, Ryan, you again, you're not super familiar with the world of Animal Crossing. I introduced you uh, to KK Slider earlier in the week. He is, of course, in the Animal Crossing world. Like he's like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and Bruce Springsteen all rolled into one. Like he is it. Uh, right, I introduced so... you to some of KK Slider's music last. So I'm just curious, as a as a for, as a as a fellow you know professional musical artiste, what what you what you think of of the KK Slider oeuvre. Well, yeah, so I went upstairs after we talked and I went up and I was on the I was on the iPad and I have two kids, uh, an 11 year old daughter and a nine year old son. And I went and pulled up KK Slider. And within a microsecond, both of my kids came over like, are you listening to KK? Are you listening to KK Slider? And I was like, wait, you guys know about this? And we don't have a switch. Like, and they barely, but, and so I was like, they're like, oh yeah, KK Slider's amazing. He's awesome. Oh, he's he's like, incredible. And I was like, and then I kind of went into the wormhole a little bit and I, I Googled and I was trying to see who he was. And I thought maybe he was a composer in LA that I might know, but he's Japanese. Um, and right. I think he's from Japan. Am I, am I correct in that? Um, KK? I, I, I honestly couldn't tell you. I don't know the behind the scenes. He's a very enigmatic KK Slider. I don't think he wants people delving into uh, his personal life. Yeah. But I do. Yeah, he is. It was a cool, I mean, yeah, this is what a weird, what a weird world and what a crazy thing where this thing where I can play like a microsecond and my kids are like, oh yeah, KK's awesome. I'm oh, like, I mean, he's got, I mean, he's got, he, he doesn't sound like anyone else on the music scene. I mean, he's got a very distinctive uh, voice um, it, and, and he does a lot of incredible covers. He does a lot of incredible um, original material. He plays a concert actually live here on the island of Kauai every Saturday at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific. And and if you listen to his whole concert at the end of it, he actually gives you a bootleg of the performance. And it's really <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, we don't never. Why do we ever need the world to open up again? I, you know, I'm fine staying here, Ryan. I don't. This, this, I, I say all the time. I, I'm here because it's better than the real world outside. Even know, when they lift like the quarantine, I might just stay. I feel like you really hit your, you really hit your stride in this era, Gary. Knowing I think you so. not even a week long, I'm like, oh yeah, this is where you belong. This is a movie that <laughs> that Emily and Colin might need to write next. We might, you know, we might. <laughs> Animal Talking, the movie. Uh, written by Emily and Colin, directed by Colin. Who knows? I mean, maybe maybe it happens, or maybe it all starts here. Uh, you know, with the AOC maybe coming on the show. Um, we've got other big guests. I, I tell you, like seriously, if I every now and again I drop Adam a text saying, you know, such and such a name is coming on the show, and Adam's like, I, I just don't believe. He literally just literally does not believe me. The the, the epic right. scale of the guests we have coming on next week and 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 through the month of May, it's it's absolutely uh, in, insane. Um, uh, Kua Suvra says we are living in Black Mirror and loving it. Well, without without wishing to uh, uh, tip my hat too much towards possible future guests on the show, you may have uh, you may have made a very interesting uh, point. There. Uh, and we and we generally I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to um, uh, boast too much. But, you know, it's a big team effort. But you know, speaking for all of us here at Animal Talking, what we're doing here live musical performances in the game. I mean, it's it's pretty insane, and it's just the beginning. And Ryan, I think so. When Raquel this is interesting, the kind of the technical you know evolution of this. When Raquel performed, uh, she performed live from her home studio but she was she was playing unplugged with a guitar and her microphone was picking up both her and the, and the, and the guitar and it sounded really good but like I didn't know if that would work for Ryan but what Ryan very cleverly did and he's opened up a whole new world for us his board his mixing board at home that his instruments and his microphone everything's plugged into he just plugged that into discord discord listens to the output from that and we actually get his all his, his completely clean high bitrate audio directly from his studio straight into discord and out into the out into the world via twitch and youtube and that's absolutely insane i just think that's that's crazy um it's it's like black mirror but wholesome it's like black fidelity. mirror but nice <laughs> 
nice. It's nice mirror. That's what we should call this. Show. Maybe nice that's the other alter- that, that, the other title for the show. And Colin Trevorrow, thank you so much for making this possible. Because the whole reason we discovered Ryan is you said, hey, if I'm coming on the show, if you want a musical guest, I should hook you up with my friend, my friend Ryan. And, and look how well it's turned out. It's true. And, and my question is, how how stoned can you make his avatar look? <laughs> the answer appears to be very stoned indeed. <laughs> I am not high right now, either in my future world or my current world. Oh, you know. That's hilarious. Um, Ryan, as it turns out, having you on the show today, I swear this wasn't planned, right? This was just a complete accident. I, people come on here and they plug things. We've got people coming up uh, on the show uh, later in the month who are plugging cookbooks. They're plugging their movie projects. They're plugging, you know, whatever. You know, check out my SoundCloud. They're plugging everything. And of course, that's why we're here. That's As a, as a late night talk show, that's part of the service that we provide it's kind of part of the social contract of a talk show if you if you come on the show and grace us with your celebrity presence and and give us ratings you in return get to plug your stuff um and but this was a complete accident as it turns out today uh may the 8th um gusta your your band your your musical outfit literally has an album dropping today i'm not getting that's correct right today and I didn't even realize that till like last night. <laughs> I, I didn't even think I knew that. I was like, oh wait, this is all, there's a lot of confluence happening. There's a lot of universal, you know, knobs twitching in the right direction here. Yeah, we have a, we have a live album that we recorded last year. We did, uh, we've done this a few times, but we play with orchestras on occasion. So we played, first time we did it was with Boston Pops like a decade ago. And then we've done it at the Colorado Symphony. We've done it in Dallas. We've done it with the, uh, Oregon Symphony in Portland and we did one with the Omaha Symphony last year with like 75 people and it was one of the most beautiful nights I mean I think you guys can understand all three four of you that are on this can understand what it's like to be moving in concert with like you know dozens and dozens of people where everybody's antenna is pointing in the same direction and with something as visceral as playing with an orchestra especially songs that I've written and then egotistically to like be the guy at the front of the ship um, it's an amazingly powerful experience and we did it uh, so it was a really it was a really beautiful night and um, and we were actually captured it and so we released it today uh, it's called we did it in Omaha and we called it Omega just because it was ridiculous um, so we're it's it's out on like Bandcamp uh, today and there's 11 songs it kind I'm of gonna, I'm gonna show um, it off right now here it is it's called oh. Omega Gusta with the Omaha Symphony digital album out now on Bandcamp and Gusta Merch Dot com. I'm very happy to help you uh, plug that. Oh, thank I mean, you. Based, based on your performance, plug. I feel like your music is something, uh, Ryan, that needs to reach more people. So I'm dropping that link into the chat right now. Check out Gusta on Bandcamp. You can get there. You can you can get their new album uh, digitally. Um, and I also just want to address a uh, a little comment from the chat here. Doodle Mime is back. Uh, any word yet on getting a sponsor or freebies from the Biscuit Company? Now, I'm glad you asked me about that because I do want to reach out again to the good people at Nabisco. I've said before <laughs> that, I, that, I, that I have re- I w- no, not only will reject, and, and Leo and Adam will tell you this is true. I have proof of this. I can show you the emails. I don't want to monetize this show. I don't want corporate sponsors. I don't want to sell out. Um, I've had major, major, like Super Bowl advertiser level corporate sponsors. No word of a lie. Come to me and say, we want to uh, give you money and put our products on this show. And I've told them all that I, I don't want your money. I'm keeping it real. We're going to keep our artistic integrity. We're going to keep our, art- our artistic truth. Um, however, there is one exception, exception that I'll make, and that is for chicken in a biscuit. I, I just love those crackers, those savory chicken flavored crackers. If, the good, if Nabisco want to put chicken in a biscuit on this show, come find, like, look, like, AOC is coming on the show, maybe. We've got big, big stars coming on the show. Chicken in a biscuit, this is your, this is your opportunity to have a real glow up. You could, you, could, you could be a part of something really special here. Uh, you know where to find me. I'm on Twitter, um, or Twitter website at gmail.com. Uh, drop me a line. Have my people talk to your people. Uh, I just want to make sure that the, 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 the word gets out to the Nabisco people because I'm, I'm very interested in getting, at the very least, a lifetime supply of uh, free chicken and Nabisco <laughs> crackers. Um, so, Ryan, you talked about it a little bit before. So this is this is a live album that you actually did with the full symphony orchestra. Is that right? Yeah. Um, yep. Omaha Symphony, Omaha, Nebraska. It was uh, 
um, yeah, we've done a we've done a few of these, but this was definitely the best one. It's a it's it's yeah. It was. I'm really glad that we were able to capture it. Sometimes you do you play the best show ever, and then you listen to it, and you're like, oh, that wasn't so good. But that didn't happen this time. I've I've got I've, I've got to apologize because I've got I've got I've, tried, I've got the picture framed up here so I can see everyone. But I almost want to want to frame poor Colin out because I got to apologize to Colin, or at least his avatar, for putting him on. I realize now when he's sitting on it, it looks like a kind of a kiddie's high chair. It does. Look um, like <laughs> it's actually called writer's chair. Uh, we have almost all the objects in the game. We have all the sofas, all the chairs. I'm, I'm really looking. I'm on the lookout for like if someone has a good armchair, something that something that would that would grant Colin the dignity uh, that he deserves. I um, mean, it's too late now, but for maybe when he comes on next. Um, oh, you know what? I'm such an idiot. I had the director's chair. I had the director's chair. Oh my god, what an idiot! In fact, look, I'm so I'm so bummed. Hold on, Adam, out of the way, please. Out of the way, please. It's, it's Feels out of the way, please. I want you to I'll, see. I'll take the high chair. I want you to see just how badly I screwed up. I'm walking off the set. I'm walking off the set, Adam. I'm going to show you. Okay, Look, I'm going to take you to my, I'll, I'm gonna take you to my I'll, private I'll office. Keep an eye. Hold on. I'm, I'm pretty back. low maintenance, guys. I can't believe I didn't think of this. What an idiot. I have it right here in my office. Look, I have the director's chair right yeah, here. Yes. Colin well, could have been we, sitting in a proper director's chair, and I put him in a children's you, eye chair. Wow. What was I thinking? Look at that. Wow. Oh my god, I'm such a dummy. Colin, I, pol I sincerely apologize to your avatar Colin's for putting him in that chair. down in the studio, just so you know. <laughs> oh my oh, goodness. You, you have that nice, green, you have that nice green rolling swivel chair, too. I, I, could, I, I could have put you in that also. Now that's a chair. One of those little brown you, I, armchairs. You, you would rather have that than... Adam, get out of my... Get, get, I'm serious. Get out of my seat. I'm, I swear. I swear, if you do that again, you don't sit in my seat. The host, that's the host's chair. You know I have only have two rules on this island. Don't touch my turnips. Just taking care Don't, no, I don't want to hear any of that keeping it warm nonsense. Don't touch my turnips and don't sit in my chair. That's all I, I only ask, you got two jobs. That's all I ask. That's all I ask. Um, we're coming up towards the end of the show. We've gone very long and that's only because our guests have been so interesting and so fascinating. Um, Ryan, thank you so much for bringing your wonderful, wonderful music onto the show and performing it live and debuting it live. That's that's amazing. Um, and again, I'm going to drop it into the link into the chat again, lest it uh, have scrolled off the screen. I really want you to to, to uh, have a chance to check out Gusta's new live album, which is now available on Bandcamp. It's called Omega. Uh, and if it's half as good as as Ryan's uh, track that he just performed live there, Ryan, I've got to ask you. I, I really want you to do it. Not again. You don't have to do it now. But like, would you be willing to come back on the show sometime? And do that Beach Boys song because you're so good at it. I don't know why why you're why you worry about doing because you're you're really good at it. And I really I really want the because again I mentioned to you when you did it like that's actually a song that has a lot of currency in the video game world because it was it became uh, it became popular again after it was used in Bioshock Infinite and gamers love that song. So I really would love to hear you do your version of it sometime on the show. Well, I thank you thank you for being kind and I appreciate that. But it's I I mean it's a the reason I even learned that song is because when all this happened I was like I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bonk out oh i've always wanted to learn how to play god only knows because but it it's notoriously a difficult song to play especially on guitar because it's like a hundred thousand chords i don't know if you right. know that it's very, I, I know very i mean i like the song I, from it's fascinating to hear from your point of view as a, as a musician that it's a very difficult song to perform i didn't i had oh, no it's idea technically it's in it's crazy and i swear this is true i was thinking about this today um i've been playing guitar i mean i'm 47 years old i've been playing guitar for you know 35 years or something there's right. like a, there's like a dozen chords I've never even played before in that song and so it's like it's just a really hard thing to like wrap my head around and also because I know a lot of people here don't know who I am and so for me to do like a, a not great version of something they know really well I don't know I mean I'm, I'm just in I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know I'm gonna, I, I don't care we're live I don't care it's my show I'm gonna twist your arm just a tiny bit would you give us just a couple of bars just to drive my audience crazy because they're gonna you're not gonna give them the whole thing but like just give them a teeny tiny bit of it you can okay, do it well, from you, the you couch gotta, you, gotta, you can do it from me, the couch you gotta, you gotta let me tune you gotta you gotta stall okay. for like get that get that so reverb okay I'm gonna vamp for a bit Adam what do you got any plans for the weekend yeah I oh god damn it I just keep hitting this. I I gotta put these party poppers away. It was uh, not going well. Here, Gary, how about this? Oh, oh you got a scorpion? This. Well, oh, very impressive. Where'd you find that? I found that outside my house last night. <laughs> That's so awesome. <laughs> 
the other the other bonus of Adam, uh, sorry, of, of Ryan only doing a very small uh, piece of the song is that we won't get copyright hit if he does only like less than thirty seconds of it. <laughs> That's what That's you true. think. <laughs> oh, he's tuning uh, up. I can hear him. I am too. Oh wait, hold on. Let me mute, let me mute the card because I don't want KK Slider's jazz stepping on your music. All right. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. We're good. We're good to go. Um, all right, I have a little reverb. Here's the deal. I'll play. I'll play. I'll play as much as I can until I mess up. Okay. All right. All right. You're on. You're on. It's a deal. It's the second I screw up. It's like it's gonna be like. Uh, what is it? What is that game show where you're like on an obstacle course and there's like a bunch of jacked up dudes. Wipeout? Yeah, and like everyone's yeah. rooting for you, and it's like, oh, he got he got demeaned. He's got knocked over by the waterfall. So like, it can be like I don't that. know. I don't know what the British accent was about, but I, I mean, I get what I get what you're saying. Um, I don't know. Right. I, I, I don't. British announcers. I, I, I don't know if you're able to monitor the Twitch channel, but I can tell you right now, everyone in the Twitch channel is rooting for you right now. They really, really right, want exactly. you to knock this out of the park. I need I need the good juju just so I can All try. Right, let's okay. do it. Let's let's, let's do it. Go. Okay, quiet, go. quiet, okay. everyone. That was wonderful. Ryan, everyone loved it. Everyone, the, the chat Especially is losing it. The, the chat I'm, is losing it. Is losing it. it. And I this is the benefit of watching the show live because we're probably not going to be able to use that on the YouTube version. Or maybe, maybe I just don't care. We'll see what happens. We'll make a decision about that later. Um, that was uh, Ryan. Thank you. I, I apologize for twisting your arm a little bit. I'm so glad you did that. That really was great. Thank you. I actually, I'm so down with the version of this where it's just like, I know, like just like the clumsy cool. version, like one of those Elvis yeah. outtakes. I love it. It's so much better. This is all my stuff right now. All this fourth wall stuff is my favorite. <laughs> that was great. That was great. Um, you know what? We're at, we're actually running so late. We're running so late. Adam, if you'd uh, please uh, uh, move yourself there over there. Thank you very much. Um, we're, we're so late running, and I actually have a call in about ten minutes. That I have to take, so I have to wrap this show up. <laughs> um, uh, you all have you all have gifts that usually we unwrap on the show, but I'm going to ask you to just wrap them when you get home. I'll I'll, I'll let you on a secret. It's a god awful raccoon figurine. The worst. The worst item in the game. There's one at the back of the set there. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, but I am asking, I am going to ask you all to um, please uh, get up off the couch and prepare your uh, party poppers because that's how we end uh, the show here. And also at the at the very end, after we roll credits and everything, uh, we are going to um, pull off our party poppers. Uh, it's very difficult. Our avatar puppeteering situation is being stretched stretched to the max right now. We've got people. Leah right now is controlling multiple characters in the game. It's really a feat. Uh, it's like Jim Henson level uh, magic that's going on right here. Um, don't forget, uh, on Monday, um, we have uh, excellent guests coming up. Greg Miller from Kind of Funny, best-selling author Chuck Wendig, and comedian Samantha Ruddy uh, will be here. Uh, don't miss that. Monday, 9 a.m. Pacific. Very excited about that. We've got incredible guests uh, coming up all next week. We actually have four shows a week. Uh, four shows next week, as if three wasn't already madness. We're doing four next week because we have so many amazing guests. We had to do an extra show to accommodate all of them. Speaking of amazing guests, I want to extend my genuine, genuine thanks to Colin Trevorrow, to Emily Carmichael, and to Ryan Miller, um, and to, and of course, Adam Nickerson and Leah Widow, without whom uh, this show would not exist. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much uh, for, being, for, for being here on the show. I love you guys, any of you, all of you, uh, welcome back any any time on the show. Um, please now, on the count of three, pull your party poppers. One, two, three. I love it. And we didn't get the sound because I've already muted the capture card for the credits because I'm still learning how to do that right. Uh, thank you from all of us here at Animal Talking. Stick around uh, for after the... <laughs> Ryan's jumping for joy. Uh, stick around uh, after the credits. We're going to raid someone. Thanks again to all my guests. Uh, we'll see you next time.